Did you know that God hates fat people? Well, maybe hate isn't the right word. God is disappointed with fat people, disgusted, and much more likely to send them to hell to burn forever and ever. Amen. Blessed are the righteous, the kind, the faithful, and the skinny. God loves a hot little beach bot. And don't get mad at me for any of this. Not my beliefs, just the messenger here. These were the beliefs of now deceased diet guru turned preacher slash cult leader, Gwen Shamlin Laura. And they remain the beliefs, as far as I know, of the followers followers of her still very active Tennessee-based church. Gwen first appeared in the spotlight in 1984 as the founder of the Way Down Workshop, uh, W-E-I-G-H, a Christian diet program that taught students that it's not your relationship with food that is bad, not exactly, it's your relationship with God that probably needs fixing. In the program, students were taught that overindulgence is a sin. Hello, gluttony. And by eating when you're not hungry, you are directly offending God. You're not overweight because of what you eat or how much you eat. You're overweight because you love food more than you love the Lord. Food is your false idol. Start putting God first in your life. Start putting Oreo McFlurry second, biscuits and gravy third, okay? Or maybe put God first, put a light salad with a few chunks of chicken breast second, uh, put uh, biscuits and gravy third, and the Oreo Oreo McFlurry uh, should be fourth. Or actually, sorry, uh, I want to get this right. Put God first, the salad second, a low-calorie vitamin-packed protein smoothie third, and the Oreo McFlurry and the biscuits and gravy, uh, those probably shouldn't even crack the top 50, really, which is a bummer and maybe a bit ironic since they are heavenly to wolf down. According to Gwen's divine teachings, by only eating when you feel hunger pain, Not only will you lose weight, but much more importantly, you'll please the Lord by no longer bowing down to the refrigerator and you'll be bowing down now to him instead. Uh, God hates it when you worship false prophets like Marie Callender or Jimmy Dean or when you bow down to the gods of a mall food court more than to him. Damn you, hot dog God on a stick. Damn you to hell, false prophet. The Way Down Workshop was massively successful and thousands of churches all across the country began offering it to their congregations. But as with all cult leaders, before too long, Gwen realized she needed to expand her empire further. She needed more money, more prestige, more power, and probably, most importantly, more control over her fans who should be her followers. So in 1999, Gwen founded the Remnant Fellowship Church in Nashville, Tennessee. For the next two decades plus, Remnant would enforce a militant-like control over its members, especially controlling their weight. Eat too much, and you're out of the cult. Hottie beach bods only, so saith the Lord. In addition to its insane teachings about weight loss, since its inception, the Remnant Fellowship has also been controversial for its beliefs regarding child discipline. To this day, Remnant Fellowship points to its astoundingly obedient children as proof that they are the one true church and the most beloved by God. However, the tactics they are taught to use in order to raise such compliant and dutiful children, such as hitting them on their inner thighs and elsewhere with shit like belts, wooden spoons, and glue sticks, of all things, are frowned upon by many, including Child Protective Services social workers. In 2004, this aspect of Remnant's teachings came under intense scrutiny when two members of the church beat their eight-year-old son to death using methods that Gwen Shamblin had taught them. And then Gwen spent organizational money on defending this couple in court. The history of Remnant is one riddled with allegations of abuse and coercion for years and years, yet it continued growing strong and garnering thousands and thousands of new members from all around the world. It seemed Gwen Shamblin's weight loss empire slash cult would never fall, but in the spring of 2021, she, her new husband, five other church leaders were killed in a plane crash, a plane that her husband, actor and musician Joe Lara was flying. After that, her congregation was forced to face a terrifying question. If the righteous are rewarded, how is it possible that the seven people the church most revered could die in such a horrible, grim way? Today we'll follow Gwen's meteoric rise from the little girl who was not allowed to speak in church to becoming the preacher at her very own house of God. We'll attempt to disentangle the appalling belief system she created, figure out how she trapped members inside of it, review some former members' testimonies, and ultimately figure out how Gwen was able to merge two things people don't normally associate with one another, weight loss and religion to form a cult so weird and also successful that it is still operating at full speed and making millions and millions in the wake of her death. All this and more in another God-fearing, weight-losing cult, cult, cult. If you can't fit into a medium-sized cult rope, get the fuck out of here. Edition of Time Suck.
This is Michael McDonald, and you're listening to Time Suck. <laughs> you're listening to Time Suck. Happy Monday, and welcome to the Cult of the Curious. I'm Dan Cummins, the Master Sucker, Count Von Count Impersonator, Action Hero People Set Marketing Consultant. Sonny Hollister, store detective intern, and you are listening to Time Suck. Hail Nimrod, hail Lucifina. Praise be to good boy Bojangles, and glory be to Triple M. I'm going to get right into it after two quick things. First quick reminder, tickets for the Wet Hot Bad Magic Summer Camp 2025, the Summer of Love, will be on sale Saturday, March 23rd at 10 a.m. Pacific time. First come, first serve. Get them all you can at badmagicproductions.com. Click on the Summer Camp banner for all the info and a link to tickets. Limited number of private accommodations will be available. And also thanks to uh, the lovely uh, people who have showed me a lot of love lately over on the Scared to Death feed regarding the new Nightmare Fuel fictional series, uh, especially the Beast of Bodhi uh, seem to be a fan favorite. So very inspiring to uh, create more. And I have a lot of, a lot more story ideas cooked up. And last thing, for whatever reason, I've been getting a lot of emails lately from folks who took a break from Time Suck the past year or two, now have come back into the fold and are having a blast. Uh, that is awesome to hear. Thank you for returning. And now let's get lost. In this week's weird ass story. Today we are going to meet one of God's most abhorrent creatures, Pat Sajak. Come on! Never gets old for me. Uh, no, we're gonna meet uh, Mrs. Gwen Shamblin Laura. Not a whole lot of setup required today. I'll mostly share the story of this cult leader's life through the uh, through the timeline. Uh, her timeline will start with her birth. In 1955, followed all the way until she died at 66 years old. But don't be sad about her death. She she died a, a fit, thin, hot little tight ass 66. So God was happy uh, in that plane crash in 2021. Along the way, we'll meet a flurry of colorful characters, most notably her second husband, actor and model Joe Lara, Tarzan himself, the guy who played Tarzan fairly poorly in the one and done 90s adventure drama TV series, uh, Tarzan, the Epic Adventures, who clearly saw Gwen as his meal ticket and a way to achieve some uh, level of fame and fortune again. Their marriage was short-lived. Joe was badly piloting the plane that was meant to take Gwen and five other church leaders from Tennessee to Florida for a MAGA rally when he became disoriented and brought the aircraft down into a full nosedive right into Percy Lake. So sad he was never able to help make America great again. But he did for a moment help make America gaunt again. He helped Gwen make America less gluttonous again. They should have had Massa hats made. Make America skinny again. Or maybe Maha hats. Make America hungry again. A lot of missed hat opportunities. Uh, about to jump into the timeline now. But real quick before we do, uh, as we lean into this calorie-restricted subject, I just want to take a moment to talk about Roscoe's Chicken Waffles. I just introduced my daughter Monroe to this place when we took a father-daughter trip to uh, Los Angeles to watch a Lakers game. It was so much fun. Uh, they lost, but we got to see LeBron cross the 40,000 career point threshold. Uh, anyway, I don't know what the fuck Roscoe mixes into their uh, breading for their chicken tenders, but they are fried fabulousness. Add some Roscoe's uh, Louisiana-style hot sauce, mix it with their Waffle House-style waffles and some syrup. Are you kidding me? Sweet, savory, and spicy. If God doesn't want me to eat that, then I guess I don't like God very much. He's a controlling, joy-hating asshole who needs to light the fuck up and let me enjoy my chicken and waffles. And that actually wasn't what I wanted to uh, talk about for a moment. I had to fast a bit for some doctor's appointments uh, uh, when adding some notes and reviewing research on this subject. Uh, I am fine, uh, by the way. And uh, I was hungry. This is a really weird subject to work on while you're hungry. Anyway, before we dive into the timeline, I want to quickly set the scene for the special breed of cult we're dealing with. By sharing an excerpt from a former member's testimony posted on the Spirit Watch Ministries website. Spirit Watch Ministries is an organization dedicated to exposing cults that claim to be Christian and providing free education, intervention, and support for both current and former members of cults and their families. We'll share their thoughts on, uh, on this uh, episode several times today. Uh, part of their mission statement reads, We have been, since 1933, countering the influence and spread of spiritually deceptive and religiously abusive groups that exist in the Tennessee Valley. Reverend Rafael Martinez, one of the leaders of this organization, actually served as one of the primary advisors during the making of the five-part HBO docuseries, The Way Down, W-A-Y. God, Greed, and the Cult of Gwen Shamblin, as they've been following and reporting on Remnant Fellowship since its inception in 1999. 
Uh, we did rely on that docuseries as one of our main sources this week. And one essay from uh, 2002 written by former members Adam and Maria Brooks talks about the abuse they endured at the hands of Gwen Shamblin and helps answer the question they were asked by Spirit Watch. Is Remnant a cult? In our opinion, yes. Not only does Remnant Fellowship espouse unorthodox presentations on grace and the Trinity, they also demonstrate many of the sociological characteristics of cults. They emphasize conformity, denigrate and shame independent thinking, have rigid authority in hierarchy structures, move people by group thinking, use fear as a motivator, and quickly and permanently expel anyone who persistently questions. Followers are typically encouraged to avoid reading articles critical of the group and are warned against speaking to former members. Remnant Fellowship exhibits cult tendencies in their recruitment tactics, short-circuiting independent thinking, and critical analysis of recruits by telling them they shouldn't trust their pastors and spiritual leaders, something they call love bombing. In their isolationism, members are encouraged to distance themselves from non-Remnant Fellowship family, sometimes even cutting off their relationships. In their thought control tactics, members are encouraged to avoid input about the group from critical sources. And in their authoritarian structure, Members are to be completely obedient to local leadership and remnant fellowship Nashville leadership. Authority seems to rest most firmly in the hands of Gwen Shamblin, who is also known as the prophetess. Ooh, that's nice. The prophetess rolls off the tongue. We've examined quite a few false prophets, but not too many prophetesses. Prophetess? Prophetesses. Yeah, I think that's right. All right, now that we know a little bit about uh, what we're getting into. Let's explore the twisted and very, very skinny life of the former big-haired, bobble-headed prophetess, Gwen Shamblin, in today's timeline. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a time-suck timeline. On February 18th, 1955, Gwen Shamblin is born in Memphis, Tennessee. She was a big baby. One might say, fat fuck of a newborn. 13 pounds, 6 ounces. She gorged herself in the womb, non-stop stuffing her fat little baby belly with mama's umbilical cord calories. Shameful. Really sinful. Just gross. I have no idea how much she weighed at birth. Uh, Gwen was raised in a household that prioritized two things. Two things she would later fuse together to create one depraved godless whore. Health and religion. Gwen's father, Walter Henley, worked as a general surgeon. And he instilled in his daughter a sense of curiosity and reverence for health care and medicine. From a young age, Gwen was concerned with the state of her health. Was she fit enough? Was she thin enough? She was also, unsurprisingly, very concerned with the state of her soul. The cult leader in the making was raised in, the, in an ultra-conservative subset of Christianity called the Church of Christ. And the Church of Christ, often referred to as the Churches of Christ, as you'll see here in a second, pretty fucking weird, at least in their structure where most churches have some sort of administrative body that they adhere to or are a part of a larger territory of churches, each church, uh, church of Christ church is its own individual entity presided over exclusively by its own autonomous government. So non-denominational, but also a bunch of these churches share the same name, which sounds honestly very confusing. I mean, imagine a bunch of Starbucks or Kentucky Fried Chicken, you know, Subway, whatever global food franchise, where from the outside, they all look the same. But each location gets to decide what its menu is. And like complete autonomy over what their menu is. And the menus differ wildly. Uh, doesn't very little consistency kind of just defeat the purpose of having the same brand name? Uh, sorry, I, um, I, can't, I can't seem to find a, uh, the bucket of original recipe chicken on the menu here. Uh, I, I must keep glancing over it. No, no, you're not. No, it's not on the menu, sir. Uh, we don't serve original recipe chicken or any other kind of chicken at this Kentucky Fried Chicken. Just ground beef and cheddar cheese, tacos, gringos, uh, tater tots, fresh squeezed oranges, uh, mini hot dogs, individual cheese or pepperoni pizzas, carrot juice, uh, caramel corn, black licorice jelly beans, falafels, uh, strawberry smoothies, beef jerky, and uh, cotton candy and caramel. Oh, I desire to see caramel popcorn. Uh, we also have uh, uh, regular popcorn. Why even call yourself a KFC then? Uh, we just like the name, KFC. We like, we like the colors. Well, I like the little bucket as far as uh, on the sign, you know, logo, whatnot. That ridiculous analogy, actually pretty accurate from what I can tell. There is an International Churches of Christ website, but it is the worst website for a large international organization I have ever seen by quite a ways. 
It looks like a high school kid built it in 2005 for a school project that he didn't get a good grade on. Like he passed a class, but barely. You can click on a button that says, how many churches of Christ are there? And they don't fucking know. (laughs) It says the most recent dependable estimate lists more than 15,000 individual churches of Christ. Imagine seeing that on like Target's website. Like you go to the store locator section and you just get a reply of, "Uh, there seems to be about four Targets in your area. We're not sure exactly where they are. Could be more. There's another menu button that says, how are the churches organizational, organizationally connected? You click on that and the first sentence is, following the plan of organization found in the New Testament, churches of Christ are autonomous. <laughs> so basically it's like, how are all your locations connected? Uh, they're not. Cool. More looked around this website run by someone who just took it upon themselves to provide some answers, I guess, uh, the more confused I became. Currently uh, doing some digging outside the website, there are about 12,000 individual churches of Christ in the U.S., with over a million members, almost 1.1 million members, mostly located in the Midwestern and Southern United States. Uh, Although it was born in America, the restoration movement of the early 19th century is when it was born. There are now more churches outside of America than inside. There's approximately 40,000 churches of Christ globally. So that website's way off. It makes a total (laughs) worldwide membership around 2 million. At the top of each individual church's government is a group of elders and pastors that have been chosen by the congregation to lead. To be an elder, You have to meet a certain set of requirements that have been outlined in the Bible. Church of Christers refer to Timothy 3, uh, verses 1 through 8, which discusses what qualifies someone to be a deacon or an overseer in the church. In the King James Version of the Bible, this passage reads, If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Not given to wine, no striker, Not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? So, you know, pretty cool. No strikers or brawlers. No strikers or brawlers. Glad that's made clear. And uh, and you have to follow the laws of gravity, I think, which is important. You don't want some fucking anti-gravity brawler floating around, throwing down punches from above. And you got to be sober. And also, in addition to being sober, you have to not drink wine either and be blameless. So no one can ever blame you for anything. I have no idea what a lot of this stuff means. I definitely don't think I've interpreted much of it correctly. Uh, The Lord continues with, Likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. Even so, must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, rooting their children and their own house as well. I think I've got it now. Bishops, they can't have any wine and neither can women. Deacons, they can, they can get buzzed, but not drunk. Everyone has to be grave, you know, and not be sarcastic and silly like the dipshit speaking right now. I definitely can't ever be a bishop. I'm, I'm not even deacon material. I love filthy lucre. More lucre, please. I'll take all the filthy lucre I can get my grubby little paws on. Although it's not explicitly listed. Uh, pretty clear that there's also one really important qualification you must have in order to hold a high position in the uh, Church of Christ. You got to be a man. Which is one of the many reasons why, as we'll get into a little later, Gwen Shamlin was such a unique uh, prophetess. I, I mean, cult leader. I mean, preacher. Instead of being part of one denomination, Churches of Christ see themselves as a part of a wider fellowship of congregations that share one goal. Creating God's perfect church on earth. Okay. I mean, clearly stated, but also seems a little, little vague. Uh, this clearly planted some seeds in Gwen's head that will bear fruit later when she creates her so-called perfect one true church. Uh, Churches of Christ believe that the Bible is absolutely factual, historically accurate, and in no way metaphorical. According to one Church of Christ website, we can rely on the Bible as a source of guidance, a tool for study, a method of correction, and a source of comfort and encouragement. It is God-breathed, and without error, and can thereby be relied upon explicitly. Well, that's fucking terrifying. And I call bullshit on that church. The whole book, without error, like zero errors, in a literal sense, and you're relying on it explicitly. Mm -mm, No. Uh, Sounds to me like they're saying that they follow the words of the Bible to the letter, literally, and no one on earth is doing that. Not a single person. Not in the past several centuries, at least, if ever. No way. Any Church of Christ congregation is following 
all the teachings explicitly to the letter. Here's an example of why I know this is true. Here's a new international version translation of Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses five through 10. I would read the King James version, but it's, it's far too confusing. It sounds like gibberish. Translated to the current age, it's still a, it's an interesting passage. Has anyone even tried to follow these verses in the past several centuries? Anyone outside of backwoods and saying cold members? If brothers are living together and one of them dies without a son, his widow must not marry outside the family. Her husband's brother shall take her and marry her and fulfill the duty of her brother-in-law to her. The first son she bears shall carry on the name of the dead brother so that his name will not be blotted out from Israel. However, if a man does not want to marry his brother's wife, she shall go to the elders at the town gate and say, my husband's brother refuses to carry on his brother's name in Israel. He will not fulfill the duty of a brother-in-law to me. Then the elders of his town shall summon him and talk to him. If he persists in saying, I do not want to marry her, his brother's widow shall go up to him in the presence of the elders, take off one of his sandals, spit in his face and say, quote, this is what is done to the man who will not build up his brother's family line. That man's line shall be known in Israel as the family of the unsandaled. No way that's ever happened within the church of Christ. No church of Christ congregate has ever been referred to as the patriarch of the family of the unsandled for refusing to marry their dead brother's wife. Not even in Israel, where there are several Church of Christ locations. Still, they claim to follow the teaching of the Bible, like this teaching, as written. No wiggle room for interpretation. That was true. I would like to see the video of some dude getting his fucking sandal taken off and then spit on by an unattractive sister-in-law. <laughs> Following God's laws. <laughs> exactly. Obviously also applies to salvation. Your churches of Christ believe that the Bible gives an exact play-by-play -play on how to save your soul. Most churches of Christ believe that there are six steps to salvation. Again, they don't all agree. And that any departure from these six steps will result in damnation. And these six, ste uh, six steps are hearing the gospel, believing the gospel, repenting past sins, confessing faith in Jesus Christ, getting baptized, and being faithful until death. Although those steps are definitive, multiple sources reiterate how each individual church of Christ can decide for themselves if they would like to omit something from that process <laughs> rather than follow all six for fuck's sake. This is idiocy. You can't follow the Bible explicitly. No room for interpretation at all. But also, oh yeah, you bet. No, you can um, you can skip a couple. You can take some personal liberties when it comes to which of God's you know laws you choose to follow. Yeah, no problem. That's That's the opposite of following everything, literally. That kind of shit irritates me to no end. It makes me think of a big family, eight to 10 kids. Everyone's gathered in the living room. Dad brings in a new dog, tells the family, this is our new dog. His name is Charlie. He is a he, he is a dog. No room for interpretation. We all need to believe that Charlie is a boy and a dog. <laughs> His daughter Susie's like, I want to call him Tommy. He's a cat to me. And the dad's like, okay, yeah, sure, Susie. That's fine. Charlie the dog is Tommy the cat to you. Then his son, Matt's like, I think Charlie's a snake, a girl snake. Okay, Matt, that's fine. Charlie's a female snake to you and a cat named Tommy to Susie, but he is also a dog, male dog named Charlie to everyone. No room for disagreement. That's fucking gibberish. Makes zero sense. But it's exactly how the churches of Christ, to me, seem to operate, right? We all agree on literal explicit interpretation. We all agree there are six steps to salvation, but we can all also not interpret the Bible explicitly and you can skip some steps. This hurts my brain. I guess I'm just a dumb Church of Christ heathen, right? Who doesn't understand how wise and reasonable all of this is. So in addition to adhering strictly to the Bible, kind of in some cases, but sometimes not, the churches of Christ also place significant emphasis, emphasis on lay leadership, probably. I'm sure there are some congregations that don't, but in general, what that means is that any member of church can participate in almost any aspect of the ministry, such as conducting sacrament, even if they're not a member of the clergy. There are two sayings related to this that come up repeatedly in Churches of Christ literature on a lot of their uh, individual congregation websites. Every member a minister and priesthood of all believers. However, of course there is a however here, despite the Church of Christ allowing laypersons to take on responsibilities that other churches reserved solely for clergy men, that does not mean that all laypersons in the church are seen as equal. It should be the, the Church of Contradictions. One Church of Christ in Epping, uh, Australia wrote on their website at Epping women and men are seen as equal in functionality with giftedness, character, and calling being the determining factor, not gender. Women are welcome to serve as pastors, elders, and deacons, but other congregations see distinct roles for men and women. 
This again reflects the right of each congregation to be self-determining according to how they read, understand, and apply scripture in their context. I feel like Epping uh, Church of Christ just threw some shade at other congregations. Uh, we here at Epping see men and women as equals. Other congregations, we realize, uh, do not. And this reflects uh, each congregation's ability, I would say, to understand correctly scripture and how to apply it. Uh, God's love extends to all of us sinners, even the even the dumb ones, unable, literally unable, because they're so stupid, to properly understand what they're reading. We see men and women as equals because we get it. We understand God and are not sexist pricks. Uh, the church of Christ that Gwen attended as a child, not as open-minded as the Epping church. They felt that God did not want women to speak in church. So quite the disparity. Some congregations have women leadership. Others don't allow women to even be talkers. Just keep your bicycle quiet and ready to ride, ladies. Be seen and not heard and whatnot, so say as someone. Not much else is known about Gwen's childhood, uh, except that she grew up as the youngest of three or four kids. Just like we will later see uh, her do with her first husband, David, she mostly acted like they do not exist. Uh, and probably because they're overweight, right? So not good to be seen in public with, uh, you know, uh, for her, for Gwen to be seen in public for these, with these shameful, embarrassing overindulgers. And I'm I'm not even kidding. Before we move on to her college years, it is important to note that although the Church of Christ is unique in a lot of ways, and honestly doesn't make any sense at all to me in many ways, the general ideas it promotes and thus the ideology that Gwen grew up with is not. Like Gwen Stewart Watson, three-time Peabody Award winner, investigative journalist who grew up in the South, in the HBO docuseries, he comments on this type of thinking, saying that Southerners understand the Bible in a very particular way, unique to their region. He says they believe that there is nobody else but Jesus, nobody even close, and that the Bible is literally true, and that it is your job above anything else to recruit people to that view. If only there were more agreement on what the view means from person to person, congregation to congregation. Uh, being raised in a church that believes it is God's one true church and raised in an environment where preachers preach having the ultimate authority on what God's will is, but also seeing that sister churches think they have the authority on what God's will is, but preach a different uh, message. I think that gave Gwen the motivation for the development of her later church. She will preach that she has the one true church. And she will preach a slightly different message in some ways, substantially different than others that the churches her congregants had previously been members of preached. October 2nd, 1962 now. Switching gears, Gwen's future husband, William Joseph Laura. Born in San Diego, California. Little is known about his childhood as well, uh, except for the fact that he did grow up with a lot of money. Money seemed to have instilled in him a, a taste for luxury, a taste he didn't want to work uh, to get for for himself or to get it for himself. Uh, his stepfather was the CEO of Wells Fargo, so big money. And during his adolescence in Newport Beach, California, very expensive place to live, very affluent, Joe was exposed to the world of private planes, expensive cars, and lots of travel. According to his later website, as a teenager, Joe surfed, played volleyball, uh, soccer, and, quote, later was voted as the most valuable player in high school as a wide receiver in football. Kind of weird. To have that on your website when you're in your late 50s, isn't it? He's 50, 58 years old when he died. And his website from that time, uh, still online. I mean, I would feel a little weird sharing high school accomplishments now or, or earlier. Uh, tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, yeah, no problem. Uh, I was a starting point guard on my junior high basketball team in seventh and eighth grade. Definitely got the game high score several occasions. And I was student body president my senior year of high school. Tough, contested three-way race, but I did win it. I'm a leader of men, boys, uh, boys and girls, I guess, since it was a public go at high school. I, I am and have long been a leader of boys and girls. At 19 years old, uh, after Joe was approached by a modeling agency, he allegedly, according to Joe, decided to turn down the many college scouts from, quote, various California universities in order to pursue work as a professional print and runway model in Paris, Geneva, and Milan. Everyone wanted him. Everyone. Please, Joe, please. C come be a star wide receiver at USC. In four years, you'll be in the NFL. No, I can't. No, I can't. I'm sorry. I'd just rather make money in Paris for being beautiful. Or maybe Milan. Sorry, I know I'm very strong and fast, but I'm also just too beautiful for football. You know what Joe did not write about himself in his bio? Uh, being humble. Again, this is just my opinion, but I highly doubt any Division I schools were flocking to young Joe Laura trying to get him on their collegiate soccer or football teams. I doubt any school from any division did. What we'll come to learn about Gwen's future second husband is that he was a self-centered, egotistical, delusional creep. 
who would probably sell his own mother's skin if he thought it was going to make him look better. Okay, back to Gwen. Sometime between 1972 and 1974, Gwen Shamlin begins her undergraduate education at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. She was thankfully allowed to speak at college. Should she have even gone though? I mean, if God didn't even think her tiny woman brain could handle speaking with the menfolk at a church, how could God think that she could handle higher education, co-ed curriculum? It seems cruel. A recipe for disaster and embarrassment. It's like asking a dog to write a research paper. Following in her father's footsteps, Gwen entered the healthcare industry and got her bachelor's in di- uh, dietetics and her master's in nutrition with an emphasis in biochemistry. As an undergrad, uh, Gwen's interest in health quickly manifested as an obsession with her weight. Uh, after gaining 20 pounds her freshman year, according to the biography on her memorial website, when she was in college, Gwen's love for God, her sudden 20 pound weight gain, and her academic knowledge collided. By studying God's perfect design and naturally thin eaters, Gwen was permanently set free from overweight and diets. Soon people turned to her for help to lose weight. Okay. I bet Gwen looked a lot healthier, happier, and prettier uh, when she had that extra 20 pounds. Sad that she me, uh, sad to me, anyway, that she spent most of her life working real hard to look like a, a brat's doll. Such a strange mashup of religion and fitness here. As Gwen's knowledge about nutrition increased, having received the upbringing that she did, she could not separate what she learned as a student from what she was taught as a Christian. This was the beginning of Gwen's unhealthy merger between God and dieting. On Remnant's news website, which, you can, as you can probably guess, is the website for Remnant Fellowship Church's uh, newspaper, one article titled, Did You Know? Learning Historical Fun Facts About This Church and Ministry, reads, How does Gwen know so much about the human body and how it processes food? She studied foods and nutrition, has a master's degree, and is a registered dietitian. You probably knew this one, but Gwen saw that God was left out of the textbooks and classrooms. And as she was called by God to teach and write, she was determined to put him back in his rightful place as the God of all foods, all science, and the whole, a lot of all caps words here, human body. Does God really need to be in all of our textbooks? Like, even if the Christian God is real, should he be in all the textbooks? I'm picturing a medical school textbook recommending thoughts and prayers as the primary course of treatment when it comes to cancer. Radiation, chemotherapy, surgery, bone marrow transplant. <laughs> no! Ah, that's too much science. Not enough Lord. Just don't be fat. Pray a lot. And it'll work out like it should. Uh, from approximately 1975 through 1980, as a registered dietitian, Gwen works as an instructor of foods and nutrition at the University of Memphis. After that, Gwen worked for another five years with the Tennessee Department of Health, specializing in issues of obesity and children's health. Backing up a bit, after almost certainly tossed around that skinny little puss of hers for free for half a decade, Gwen marries her first husband, David Shamblin, giving him patriarchal authority to use her war-torn bicycle seat as he pleases in a private and largely secret ceremony in 1978. David was born and raised in nearby Chattanooga, Tennessee, and both husband and wife were 23 years old when they got hitched. We couldn't find out exactly when, because to this day, much of the details of Gwen's life have been concealed by the Remnant Fellowship Church. Classic cult leader move. Hide your history. Mystery is much better than boring, average, mundane, biographical details when you're establishing yourself as a prophet or a prophetess. Also, the more you hide, the more you can change when you uh, inevitably start to build a backstory, elevating your status. Uh, Within the first couple of years of their marriage, we do know that David and Gwen had two children. Michelle Elizabeth, who later changed her name to go only by Elizabeth, and Michael Shamblin. Poor Michael. Poor chubby Michael. Such a disappointment to mama. Not even kidding. Uh, At the beginning of their marriage, David was an enthusiastic and visible champion of Gwen's teachings and career. However, as time went on, he slowly faded into the background of his wife's massive empire until eventually he was booted out completely for not being skinny enough. Seriously, Gwen was a fucking terrible person. Not a good meat sack, not a good mom, not a good wife. Uh, 1980, Gwen starts working as a weight loss consultant. The angle she took when counseling was that science couldn't explain why some people were overweight and others were not. The only thing that could explain that uh, was God and people's relationship to him. And, and that's not true. Uh, science can explain why some people are overweight and others are not. Many years ago, researchers found a certain genetic mutation that tells our body to store much more fat than necessary and millions of Americans have it. Certain uh, metabolic disorders are the result of hereditary or genetic factors rather than lifestyle choices. 
Some of us have obesity-related genes thanks to parental obesity, or we suffer from unhelpful genetic variations in certain genes, such as the gene that regulates uh, satiety, uh, the gene that controls the production of body fat, diabetes genes, etc. Additionally, not every human body has the same level of metabolism. And this means that genetics may affect the amount of fat stored in a person's body very differently than someone else's. There are also genetic diseases such as Prader-Willi syndrome, which presents symptoms of con- uh, constant hunger, excuse me, overeating and delayed development. Underlying medical conditions, medications, hormonal imbalances can make it much harder for some people to lose weight than for others. Certain physical disorders, illnesses, diseases can affect weight and obesity such as hypo- hypothyroidism or underactive thyroid which causes the metabolism to slow down or diseases like Cushing syndrome in which the body produces higher than normal levels of cortisol. Birth control pills can also cause the body to store more fat than normal as can some antidepressants and steroid medications and more hormonal imbalances in postpartum mothers and menopause women also uh, contribute to, to unsuccessful weight loss and on and on and on. This commonly held mentality that weight loss is just about willpower. And then if you just eat less and work out more, the pounds will slough off for everybody. No problem. It's bullshit. What works for you might not, in fact, work for your neighbor. I used to think it was real simple. Uh, Back when I was in my teens, early 20s, had a super high metabolism. I could drop weight real easy when I cut calories and kicked up cardio. And I can still lose weight, but it is much harder. I have to work out a lot more than I used to, be far more strategic about my caloric intake than I used to be. When I think of how calories affect different people so differently, uh, I think of my great-grandparents on my maternal grandma's side. Grandpa John and Grandma Stell, Grandma Betty's parents. Grandpa John, very active dude. Cut firewood. He worked in a sawmill for years and years and also construction before that. Uh, worked in his yard, did a lot of manual labor well into his 70s. Grandma Stell, not a very active person. Did a little bit of housework. Uh, not a lot, actually. Uh, kind of chilled out most of the time, <laughs> at least in later years. Didn't exercise at all, literally ever in her entire life. Never had a job outside the house that I'm aware of. Also seemed to hate vegetables. Loved fried food. Did not eat healthy. And based on what I remember as a kid, her meal portions, roughly the same as Grandpa John's, even though he was taller and broader. Neither were snackers. Neither had big sweet tooths. I don't remember them uh, ever eating much dessert. But he probably held an extra 30 to 40 pounds on him than, you know, his ideal weight, mainly around his midsection when he was in his 70s. Based on photos of my grandma Stell when she was young and memories of her, she was a fucking bean pole. I am talking olive oil from the Popeye cartoons physique her entire life. I mean, skinny. Genetics played a massive factor, right? In how much that she was uh, able to eat and not, you know, add weight. And they, and they do that with all of us. It's different for everybody. Gwen, and Gwen knew that. She knew that from her studies, but ignored it and punished people. Punished people she supposedly loved anyways because she was a piece of shit. She didn't give a fuck about God. She used faith to not build God up, but to build herself up in true cult leader form. I think from the beginning, her grift was always about her, always about her power. Essentially, in the early years, Gwen's half-baked, if baked at all, dietary premise was that your hunger for food wasn't actually hunger at all. It was you trying to fill an empty void in your soul with material things when the only thing that could fill it was God revolutionary. I've always thought that one of the reasons I continually hurt my body fat goals is, uh, and have a few Oreos or maybe like a bowl of ice cream or maybe a maple bar or old fashioned glazed donut at the end of the day after working out that morning, eating pretty healthy the rest of the day is because I'm addicted to sugar. And also because I'm an emotional eater. And when I'm tired, I can feel a little bit down and I know that something sweet will immediately cheer me up. And that feels good, but no, no, that's wrong. I've, I've had it all wrong. I have not been craving sugar all these years. I've been craving the Lord. I tell myself I want to chew up and swallow and digest some Oreos, maybe some double stuffed Oreos. But really, I want to chew up and swallow and digest baby Jesus. I want to to eat baby Jesus. That's what I'm figuring out now. I want to gobble up and swallow the Lord, I think. Maybe I'm missing something. Uh, This new and insane perspective on dieting established the foundation for Gwen's way down workshop. Let's check back in now with Tarzan. 1984, 22-year-old Joe Lara started dating a 16-year-old in his acting class named Natasha Pavlovich. Natasha was a model who won the title of Miss Beverly Hills in 1989 or would win it, Miss California finalist in 1990, Miss Yugoslavia in 1991, and then that same year, a semifinalist for Miss Universe. Uh, Also appeared as a guest star on various TV shows from 1992 to 2013. These two will date on and off for 23 years. 
until 2007, when Natasha will cut him off completely. Before breaking things off, they'll have a child together and then a nasty custody battle. She'll also possibly be the only woman Joe ever dated who was younger than himself. More on that soon, his, uh, his little grift. In 1996, back to Gwen, she officially starts the Way Down Workshop after being informed by God directly, she had a vision, that it was her divine duty to make people skinny. It may sound like I'm being sarcastic again, but absolutely not. Uh, Gwen believed and taught her followers to believe, which they still do, that she was chosen by God to teach his people how to honor him with their eating habits. Gwen, it's me, God. I'm sick of the fatties, Gwen. They're hard to look at. All the rolls, the chins. I can't take it, Gwen. I wish I would have never created sugar or cocoa or Twinkies. Or yoga pants, spandex shorts, tube tops. Ugh. I worked really hard to create a beautiful world, Gwen. But now when I gaze my loving eyes upon it, all I can see are huge, flabby asses. Big thunder thighs and floppy, heavy, weak arms. I haven't been able to look down and have a boner in many years, Gwen. Gwen, I need your help. We have to get these fat fucks to stop snacking on donuts. Start eating veggies, Gwen. Sorry about the language. Just bums me out and stuff. That's something I got. Uh, at its inception, the Way Down Workshop was a uh, singular program offered by the counseling center Gwen worked at in Memphis. In its early years, the workshop was basically just a weekly class slash support group led by Gwen on how to use faith to punish fat people. I mean, lose weight. And was held at the local mall. Uh, I hate to think what Gwen, I mean God, would think of my stomach. Not sure I'd be welcomed into her church. I'm fairly lean everywhere else, but, uh, you know, I always seem to hover uh, around second trimester status with my midsection. God's probably up in heaven right now looking down on me thinking, bigger t-shirts, bro. You got to at least try to make it not so noticeable, Cummins, you stupid fat spare tire fuck. Now back to Tarzan again. After moving to L.A. to pursue his dream of being filthy rich and famous. In 1989, Joe Laura, one of the greatest high school wide receivers in the history of California, if not the world, guy who could have easily been a first ballot NFL Hall of Famer, if he wouldn't have been so damn beautiful, is cast in the lead role in CBS's movie of the week, Tarzan in Manhattan. I'm sure you've heard of it. I mean, who hasn't? I'm sure you've watched it and own the collector's edition 25th anniversary Blu-ray DVD that includes the director's cut. <laughs> Check out this little promo. This little promo for this uh, made-for-TV movie. It's amazing. One of the world's wildest heroes is back in an amazing adventure. This time, he's fighting for animal rights, and he's up against the world's most dangerous predator. Mm. He's stalking a different kind of beast mm. in a different kind of jungle. Tarzan in Manhattan, Tuesday. <laughs> Tarzan in Manhattan. I think it says a lot about Joe's acting abilities or lack thereof, how he never speaks in the promo. <laughs> in the movie and in subsequent series, uh, they even dubbed uh, a Tarzan yell from another Tarzan actor from the 1930s, uh, Johnny Weissmuller, Weissmuller, because Joe couldn't do the yell. On uh, that promo, they just kept showing close-up shots of his oiled up, muscled body as he hung from a vine. Dude was handsome. I'll give him that. Kind of had a Fabio cover of a romance novel look long flowing locks chiseled jaw you know big wrist solid skull definite giga chat territory uh playing tarzan wasn't joe eyes his big break he'd been attending acting classes for the last couple of years to perfect his craft expensive classes that he did not pay for not directly former friends of his would later say they had no idea how he paid for them excuse me in the three plus years that he had been in the city of angels joe never worked a real job and landed very few modeling or acting gigs he wasn't actually spending a bunch of time in Paris or Milan setting the modeling world on fire. So where did the money to fund his lifestyle uh, come from? According to a man that attended an acting workshop with Joe, excuse me, my gosh. Uh, according to, <laughs> try to drink some water during that thing. And okay. According to a man who attended an acting workshop with Joe, uh, he always had older girlfriends who provided for him. Tarzan Bigelow, male gigolo. Uh, that is the original Tarzan Call of the Wild from Johnny Weissmuller, uh, basically the Michael Phelps be of the world swimming world before Phelps was born. Uh, the cry dubbed in for Joe's Tarzan roles. Johnny was an Olympic swimmer who won five gold medals 
After retiring from competitive swimming, he played Tarzan in a dozen feature films produced between 1932 and 1948. Back to Joey Grifter, knockoff Tarzan. Uh, that handsome bastard never had to pay rent because he never had his own apartment. He just moved from one rich woman's house to another whenever he was inevitably kicked out for being a disingenuous freeloader. He went from living off daddy's money to living off of the money of old ladies he scammed. Older ladies. Uh, often uh, while also dating young Natasha. He was a Hollywood dirtbag. Prior to landing the role of Tarzan, still in his early 20s, one of the many women Joe leached off of was a fellow student in one of his acting classes named Dory Frostman. At the time, Dory was tall, blonde, and in her late 50s. Not only did Dory, like his previous older girlfriends, pay for Joe's groceries, acting classes, clothes, let him live with her, everything. While they were dating, she also bought him a Harley Davidson motorcycle. And like in most of his other relationships around this time, Dory and Joe's romance would be short-lived. Not long after she bought him that badass bike, she set that bike on fire <laughs> and threw him out of her house because he cheated on her. Oh, well, for Joe, uh, he was supposedly already scamming some other lady of means. Uh, speaking of ladies of means, 1991, Gwen moves her program out of the Secular Counseling Center and into God's house, specifically the Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis. That's when the Way Down Workshop really started to hit its stride and Gwen started to cash in. Out of what began as a community support group, Gwen had now developed a 12-week weight loss program that, as she put it, taught people to, quote, stop bowing down to the refrigerator and start bowing down to him, capital H. People slimming down, getting those bikini bots, thanks to the Lord. God loves a girl with itty-bitty waist. Jesus is probably up in heaven right now wearing a no fatties tank top, <laughs> lowering his sunglasses, you know, he wears beneath his Budweiser visor so he can check out some hot bods. You know, a couple sexy new heaven entrants coming in. All right, all right, all right. Looking good, ladies. Can you imagine if that's who God really was? What an unexpected twist for so many people. Like you're a good Christian woman. You work hard to be faithful your whole life. Humble, repentant, following all, following all kinds of rules. The most your friends don't have to. You stay nice and fit your whole life. Then you die young and are overjoyed when you do make it to heaven. It is real. But then you haven't been up there for two minutes when you hear a cat call. Or what that can do a cat call. There we go. You look around. It's Jesus. He's listening at you. He's 100% eye-fucking you. Looking good, girl. Oh, look at those abs. That is why you take care of your temple, baby. Oh, spin around for me. Let me see what you're working with. You're new here, right? Let me give you a little tour. And then by tour, he just takes you directly into his huge master bedroom with a massive circular waterbed in the middle. When you frown, he's like, come on, baby. Let the Lord see you smile. You're so much prettier when you smile. Uh, before long, <laughs> the Way Down Workshop, well, it was terrible, uh, was being offered in hundreds of churches across the country. It was a smash hit. And Gwen became an overnight celebrity for God-loving souls struggling with their weight. In order to offer the program, churches, of course, first had to purchase it uh, in its entirety, directly from Gwen. Good profit margin. After that, both members and non-members of their congregation could pay a fee to attend the workshop, part of which went to the host church, part of which went back into Gwen's bank account. For the duration of the program, members would gather together at church once a week to watch videos and listen to audio cassettes of Gwen spreading the good word of how to become God's skinny little bony-ass shepherd, uh, or bony-ass sheep, <laughs> rather, and then discuss as a group. In between meetings, members tracked their progress with workbooks. According to an archive article from Delaware's The News Journal, published on April 13th, 1997. First timers paid a fee of $103 to participate and then would return for a second time if they wanted for a $55 discount. After that, they could redo the program again for free. Gwen's killing it. I, I wonder what part of the fee she kept. Probably at least 20%. I mean, if not 50%. Let, let's say it's 20%. And an average of just five people per church take this course for their first round, you know, first go round. I bet it's probably more people than that. Probably quite a few more. Uh, but let's be very conservative. That would be $20.06 per person. So $103, uh, a 12-week course, you know, three months. So a church could run that course four times a year. Let's say they only do they only do three times. That would be $309 in this example to Gwen per church per year. That does not count what the church got for originally buying her program, you know, like what she got. If they if they charge each person $103 a course, I'm sure buying the materials must have cost, you know, quite a bit more than that. Let's say $200. Uh, you know, conservatively, Let's say it was 300 churches. That would be $92,700 for course takers per year. Another 60,000 for buying the course on the low end. I bet you did a lot better than that, but, but that is $152,700 a year in 1995. 
equivalent to around $310,000 today. Pretty good for getting going. Uh, and then she got, you know, way more church than that. She got up into thousands and thousands. There's no exact count. But amidst the prevalent weight loss culture of the 1990s, which was rife with calorie counting, scheduled eating, body shaming, excessive dieting, the Way Down Workshop stood out due to its lack of diet. The Way Down Workshop teaches that there are no foods that you need to avoid as Jesus declared all foods to be clean. In Mark 7, Jesus says, because it goeth not into his heart, but into his belly and goeth out into the draught. This he said, making all foods clean. The Way Down Workshop teaches that it's not how much you eat or what you eat or even whether or not you exercise that is causing you to gain weight. It's the fact that you love food more than you love God. Uh, it's the fact that you love a material thing more than you love God. Although in the 1990s, thousands thanked God and Gwen for helping them lose weight, both she and God received significant ridicule for reinforcing the idea that being fat's a sin. Uh, when faced with that criticism, Gwen's response was always the same. It's not that God hates fat people. It's that God is jealous of how we overindulge in and submit to food. Being fat does not offend God. She would say overeating does, but I don't believe, I don't think she believed <laughs> that being fat did not offend, was not offensive. Uh, when asked in one televised interview, are you worried at all that you're sending the message that God only likes thin people? Gwen responded, mm-mm, I don't think he looks at the outside as much as the heart. That's what he says. I, th I think he's jealous. He's jealous of us worshiping objects more than him. Jealous? This amazing, literally perfect, omnipotent, almighty, universe-creating being. Is jealous of donuts? <laughs> like, is God a divine, all-powerful creator or some version, uh, and benevolent, or some version of King Joffrey from Game of Thrones? Some petulant tyrant? Some powerful, petty, teenage, medieval king? Hey, why do you give so many compliments to the Duke of Lancaster? Yet you shared no such pleasantries towards myself. Do not find my hair to be thick and luxurious. Do not find my eyes to be deep and true. Who's the fucking king here? I should have you killed immediately. No, I will have you killed. Gods, take her to the dungeon. Do what you wish to her before stretching her on the rock until she breaks. So now God is uh, King Joffrey. King Joffrey the Jealous. And in order to avoid displeasing Joffrey God, the Way Down Workshop teaches members to simply eat when they're hungry, never before, but like real hungry. One local organizer of a Way Down Workshop named Diana Johnson was quoted in the February 27th, 1994 issue of the Tennessean as saying, this is not a diet. It's about moderation, not deprivation. When you diet, it makes you too food focused, giving food too much glitter and power. But when God sent us here, he didn't send us with a diet sheet from a doctor. God has given us an internal hunger mechanism. If we can get back in touch with that, we'll eat when we're hungry, stop when we're full. Uh, yeah, that internal hunger mechanism is for sure broken in some people, but you know, whatever. <laughs> who cares about proven science? Uh, who cares this hunger mechanism 100% for sure does not work the same for everyone. You know, that doesn't work for Gwen's simplistic message and marketing. So, you know, fuck it. Uh, the Way Down Workshop teaches participants that they cannot eat unless they receive clear hunger cues from their bodies, like feeling an ache in their stomach or hearing their stomach growl. Yeah, that's... Uh, that's unnecessary. Uh, total caloric intake over the course of the day versus calories burned through activity is the most important criteria for weight loss. Those calories can come in a few bigger meals, uh, a lot of smaller snacks. Research shows that it actually doesn't matter which route you choose there. You definitely don't need to starve yourself. Uh, Gwen taught that if you're uh, feeling a longing for food before you're in actual pain, you need to drop to your knees in prayer and give that sinful desire over to God. Let God eat for you. Or something like that. Uh, or when you receive powerful hunger cues from your body, uh, is it acceptable to God for you to, oh, sorry, oh, excuse me, only when you receive powerful hunger cues from your body, is it acceptable to God for you to eat? But you're still not out of the woods. Because once you've started eating, you're still at risk of upsetting the Lord by eating too much. That's why the program also teaches members to recognize signs from their body that mean they've eaten enough. Basically, God is always watching you, including when you eat very closely. Do you really need to finish that chicken fried steak or do you need to push your plate back, right? And not end up in hell, fatty. In the 90s, Gwen invented two metrics to help people identify these hunger cues and signals. On a scale from one to 10 of hunger pain intensity, uh, when you reach a level seven, that's when it's time for you to eat. Levels one, two, three, four, five, and six mean no snack for you, only prayer. Your stomach isn't hungry yet. Your spirit is. On a scale from one to 10 of uh, satiety, when you reach a four, which means you feel uncomfortable, but not full. Then it's time to stop eating. 
Uh, okay, quick side note on this revolutionary idea of Gwen's, uh, which she did market as revolutionary, it is not. It's shit that was already common knowledge by the time Gwen, quote, invented it. Just repackaged. You know, this happens all the time in the health and wellness industry. Groundbreaking workouts and diet plans. Just repackaged versions of the same old shit people have been doing for years. The basis of the Way Down Workshop is just intuitive eating. And intuitive eating was around a long, long time before Gwen discovered its benefits. Uh, what she did was repackage this already existing concept, as I said, add a big heaping of God to it, and then sell it to people as something groundbreaking. In one promotional video for the Way Down Workshop, she says, God revealed to me that this was the true deliverance and that the key to permanent weight control is a matter of the heart. You know who that sounds a lot like? Spiritualist con artist, Jeff and Shalia Devine, who we covered in episode 381, The Twin Flames Universe. Although at first glance, new age spiritualist gurus, YouTubers, cult leaders, Jeff and Shalia, appear to be the polar opposite of the Bible thumping weight loss prophetess, they actually have quite a bit in common, particularly in regards to how they present it for themselves or when, you know, uh, Gwen's case presented themselves as gatekeepers of divine information. And what I mean by that is the overarching narrative slash marketing strategy of the Way Down Workshop essentially identical to that of Jeff and Shalia's Ascension School. It's almost like, as I mentioned many times before, no matter how different their teachings might be, all cult leaders utilize the same manipulative tactics and ultimately exhibit exhibit the same behaviors. Uh, as we know, Jeff and Shalia claim that uh, what they teach has never been taught before by anyone else in the history of the world because the knowledge they have uh, was given to them, only to them, directly from Mother, Father, God. That's the biggest selling point of the Twin Flames universe. Unless you attend their ridiculously expensive classes, you will never, ever gain access to the super special, top secret, VIP, cool kid knowledge that God entrusted to the most righteous people on earth today, Jeff and Shalia, dipshit fuckface. I mean, divine. Similarly, Gwen Shamblin pretended up until the very end of her life that what she was teaching was brand new and revolutionary, sacred knowledge that had been bestowed upon her, to her directly from our father who art in heaven and no one else. She asserted that unless you pay for the way down workshop and a decade later, unless you also join her one true church, you'll never gain access to her righteous divine info. And that's a great grift. It reminds me of a small town drug dealers grind, right? You want this shit? You want this good shit that takes all your pain away? Well, then this is what you have to pay because I'm the only motherfucker selling it, baby. Uh, in addition to the hunger cues scales uh, at the Way Down Workshop, you were also taught to do things like put Bible verses on your pantry and refrigerator to remind you to turn to God instead of turning to food. This is because as Gwen teaches or taught, the desire for food without the accompanying hunger cues is not hunger for food at all, right? It's a spiritual hunger. The only way to satisfy it is with a bowl of Lucky Charms poured uh, out of a freshly opened box with nice, cold, fresh milk poured on top and, and a glass of fresh squeezed orange juice on the side. Mm, mm, or with God. Uh, actually, only with God. I know it might seem like a bowl of delicious Lucky Charms would also satisfy your desire, but not true, according to Gwendolyn. Uh, when people would tell her that they felt the urge to snack, Gwen would state, <laughs> I, say, I say, chew on this. And I hand them a Bible. She actually stopped saying that towards the end of her, of her life for legal reasons. In the early years, uh, several of her followers uh, died from eating too many Bibles. One of them choked to death on a heaping of Leviticus, King James Version. Uh, JK, of course. Another tactic the Way Down teaches is that whenever you sit down to eat, put a box of plastic wrap on the table to remind you to only consume a half portion. Put the other half away later before you get full. Uh, similarly, whenever you go out to eat at a restaurant, Gwen advises you should order it to go back with your food immediately for the same reason. Uh, if you find yourself still struggling, the Way Down also sold and still sells today a nifty little device called the Gluttony Stick. And this is fun. It's a thick oak club, approximately 20 inches long. Bottom six inches are wrapped in a leather sheath for enhanced grip. Top of the club widens in diameter from about a one and three quarter inch at the bottom handle to three inches at the top of the club. Also, the top of the club wrapped in what looks like a very heavy grain sandpaper, like 2040 grit. And uh, what you do with this handy little device is if you're struggling with pushing your plate away, you, you grab this gluttony stick and you just, you just hit yourself. You just hit yourself in the calf or inner thigh hard w while you whisper, stop resisting the Lord, you stupid, weak, fat fuck. The rough surface of the top of the club will reduce the chance that the stick will slip off on impact and ensure a, a solid contact and thus more pain. Each blow should give you a real nice bruise. Not so general reminder that God is so disappointed. 
You stupid fat ass. God, he still loves you, but he doesn't like you. He, he for sure doesn't respect you. So do better, tons of fun. Or should I say tons of sin? There's no gluttony stick. You knew that. Uh, but would you really have been surprised if there was one? Back to the real program now. Uh, if you avoid eating too much, not only will you please God by refusing to indulge, you'll also uh, get super, super skinny. And as countless former members report at the Way Down Workshop, skinnier you are, the faster you lose weight, the more God loves you. God loves a tight-toned, rock-hard little pooper. God loves to see body fat below 7%, and nothing, I mean nothing, gets God's dick harder than a six-pack. Mm, mm. uh, in the documentary, one former member spoke about how Gwen constantly taught students that they already have breakfast, lunch, and dinner <laughs> on their bodies, referring to their excess fat. And if their body really needs food, but they haven't felt any hunger pains yet, well, it'll just use that extra breakfast, lunch, and dinner right on you to sustain yourself. 1996, uh, Gwen establishes the Way Down Headquarters in Franklin, Tennessee, with a staff of 40 devotees that I doubt she paid much or at all. Half a decade in, and the Way Down Workshop was already being offered in thousands of churches all across the country in every single state, and even a few others abroad. She's making millions now. Part of the reason it was so successful is because uh, it really was working. Starvation is a great way to lose weight and permanently damage your body as well. Heart disease, osteoporosis, nerve damage, significant hormonal imbalances, uh, numerous gastrointestinal issues, on and on. But it does work as far as weight loss. Turns out if you just literally stop eating or something close to that, you will lose weight. It's called anorexia. A uh, great way to fuck up people psychologically as well. Uh, you know, give them or exacerbate uh, eating disorders such as anorexia, bulimia. But again, does and did work. People really were losing significant amounts of weight through Gwen's program. Uh, in almost every single newspaper article from the 90s about Gwen Shamlin that we found, there were at least two quotes from local Way Down students talking about how much weight they lost in the program. And more often than not, talking about how they had never been able to make any progress in their weight loss journey prior to starting it. 1994, one devout woman who attended the workshop at Woodmont Hills Church of Christ in Tennessee. Gwen knew how to market to her old church. Uh, this one was quoted in the local paper as saying, I've been through 18 diets antidepressant medicine, counseling. Nobody could heal my heart. Nothing worked until I fully asked God for healing. And I hadn't thought of overeating as a sin before as something disobedient to God. I know that God's interested in my welfare and my weight. Uh, it's too much work for me alone, but it's nothing to him. She wanted to say in the six months she'd been in the program, she had lost uh, 93 pounds and her husband, who was also in the program, had lost 52, which is impressive. A uh, bummer that they had to connect their weight loss to God's love for them or lack thereof though. Uh, in Farmington, New Mexico, 1996, a local woman named Donna Peak was interviewed about her experience in the workshop. After attending the 12 uh, week program three times consecutively, she went from 276 pounds to 48 pounds. What? What a miracle. Oh, God loved her so much. So skinny. So beautiful. Sure, maybe she lost most of her teeth to malnutrition and she became legally blind. <laughs> yeah, essential nutrients, depletion, you know, left her with permanent brain damage. But who cares? Who needs teeth or vision or short-term memory or all your hair or to have skin not constantly covered in bruises or, or to not live in constant chronic pain when you have the love of God? Oh, uh, she was not 48 pounds. <laughs> thank God. Feels weird to say thank God there, but whatever. Uh, she ended up at 153 pounds, which is, you know, pretty impressive. In the article, she said, through prayer and having faith in God, I've kept the weight off. In that same article, an outreach director at the Way Down headquarters named Renee Reed is quoted as saying, the only exercise you need is getting down on your knees. Pretty sure she's talking about prayer there, but uh, uncomfortable wording. That same quote could be uh, also used to sell a diet plan based mostly on dick sucking, which also could be a great way to lose weight. I mean, if you think about it, whenever you get hungry, just suck some dick. Or to make it fair for more folks on the sexual spectrum, uh, eat some puss. Let a, let a bit of cum or lady loop sustain you. If you could just do this for all of your meals, like but one each and every day, oh, you will lose so much weight and you will make your partner or many partners or some strangers very happy. Blessed be the skinny cocksuckers. Blessed be the svelte puss eaters. That might be the best diet ever, actually. Losing weight doesn't just make you happy. It makes the many people around you happy. But I don't think God would approve, right? He gets jealous, remember? He wants you to worship him. He wants you to figuratively suck his dick only and no one else's. Uh, back to Gwen's revolution now. 
Uh, as multiple news stations reported in the mid-90s, the results of the Way Down Workshop were staggering. There were testimonies everywhere you looked from people who had lost hundreds of pounds by following Gwen's advice. In addition to guaranteeing astounding weight loss results, the Way Down Workshop was also attractive to a lot of Christians during this time because Gwen appeared to stand in sharp contrast to the other, you know, notable Christians of this period, a lot of televangelists who, uh, you know, uh, had very questionable morality at best. Gwen dressed modestly in plain clothes and her hair still at a normal human height at this time, was traveling around speaking in small churches and seemingly actually living the pious life she preached about. She seemed like a breath of fresh air when compared to the greedy, conniving Jim Bakers, Jimmy Swaggarts of the world, both of whom got caught in highly publicized sexual scandals. Baker also went to prison for committing fraud and stealing from his congregation. As cult interventionist, director of Spirit Watch Ministries, Reverend Rafael Martinez says in the docuseries, Americans were seeing the big fat cat leaders in the churches living such immoral and materialistic lives. So they began to view the Way Down Workshop and its teaching and its claims and what Gwen was saying as an alternative, as an outlet to get their spiritual needs met. Little did they know that despite her innocent facade, Gwen was just as gluttonous, just as predatory, just as self-serving as those male televangelists. Uh, the Way Down was an instant success, right? Bridged the gap between people who were struggling with their weight and people who thought God had all the answers. 1996, big year for Gwen. Uh, June 28th and 29th, the first national conference of the Way Down Workshop was held in Nashville, Tennessee. Following year, 1997, Gwen published her first book, The Way Down Diet, through Doubleday. Uh, here's a little blur regarding the book's contents from its Amazon page. This is not a diet like others because it, it is not food focused. It contains chapters such as it's not genetics or your mother's fault. I feel hungry all the time and how to eat potato chips and chocolate. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't make up those chapters. There really is a chapter called how to eat potato chips and chocolate. First off, sometimes it really is genetics, Gwen, but you know, again, fuck science, whatever. Uh, also, I would love it if the chapter how to eat potato chips and chocolate uh, just literally had diagrams illustrating exactly how to do that. Like really dumbed down. Uh, step one, carefully place one to three chips in your fingers, like so. Step two, place chips into your mouth, ideally placing them directly upon the tongue. Warning, uh, be sure to remove your fingers from your mouth before biting down on the chips. Uh, this is very important. Failure to do this uh, can result in serious injury. Step three, chew all your chips uh, thoroughly before swallowing, you dumb chip-loving, God-displeasing, fat fuck cow of a person. Uh, you get it. Uh, the following year. Gwen appears on the Larry King Live show, greatly expands her audience. Uh, I hate it that these people were having her on. As the Way Down Workshop grew more popular and more members were having success with it, uh, Gwen now started to preach that his teachings could be applied to fix any problem. Not just, not just uh, obesity, drug addiction, uh, depression, poor finances, poor health. Anything and everything could be fixed by just giving your indulgence over to God and realizing that the bad things are only happening to you because you're disobeying God. Just the pray it all away method. Oh man, just juvenile, simplistic, magical thinking at its finest. Uh, you know, many church leaders have tried to use this exact same method to cure sexual predators of pedophilia for centuries. Uh, it's never worked. There's a lot of shit. You just can't pray away. It's a reckless, dangerous, dangerous, wildly irresponsible message to put out there. Gwen soon started broadening her claims even further, started to claim that the problems of America's church, like materialism and the clergy and disregard for the Bible's teaching could be fixed and could only be fixed by the same doctrine, her doctrine, cult, cult, cult. As Reverend Martinez says in the documentary, Gwen began preaching that, quote, Christian perfectionism could only be achieved by following her message. And so from that point on, she began realizing, well, there needs to be a new church. There needs to be a new restoration. And that's when she incorporated the Remnant Fellowship Church. And here we fucking go. March, 1999, Gwen, her husband, and six other people create the Remnant Fellowship Church, or as she called it, the One True Church. Of course, not a good church or a great church, not even a righteous church. Still not enough. Her church was the one true church. Just like Tansik is the one true podcast. Cult, 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 hail Nimrod. The one and only true podcast, God. Lucifina, Lucifina just glared at me. Uh, at the annual Desert Oasis Conference, July 14th and 15th, 2000, in Nashville, Tennessee, Gwen officially renounces the establishment, or uh, excuse me, not renounces, very different, uh, announces not renounces, announces the establishment of the Remnant Fellowship Church. Immediately, it is controversial. While half of the audience uh, buys in to her pretentious declaration, other half does leave in disgust. I'll share additional reasons why they left some controversial theological assertions Gwen was making here in a bit. 
To the audience of nearly a thousand people, plus those who could watch it on DVD later, Gwen announced, God is rebuilding this city with a righteous remnant, whether you want to be a part of it or not. And just as in Nehemiah's day, he has chosen only the obedient survivors from the exiles, those who returned and obeyed his commands. I've wondered if there was a church or a true church on this earth or not, or was it just going to exist in heaven? I have good news. I have found God's church. She did it. She fucking did it, everybody. Oh, her little brat stall, bobblehead, bony ass did what no one else could ever do. She found the one true church. And, and guess where it was? <laughs> right on her property. How, how amazing. And by found, uh, she meant about to be built by her in order for her to make millions of dollars in profit. Oh, how fun. Uh, if you're not familiar with Nehemiah, his story appears in the book of Nehemiah, 16th book of the Old Testament. Nehemiah was a Jewish uh, nutritionist and rabbi in the 5th century of BC who first promoted the idea that fat chicks and husky hanks <laughs> couldn't get into heaven. Uh, there's a version, or that is a version of his most famous quote, book of Nehemiah, chapter 3, verse 1. It is easier for a thin-wristed Melvin to enter a Giga Stacy's top shelf vagina than it is for a low-tier fatty normie to waddle their humongous ass inside the pearly gates. Uh, for real now. Uh, Nehemiah did live in the 5th century BC. He was a Jewish leader who supervised the rebuilding of Jerusalem. Jerusalem? <laughs> Why do I fuck that word? It's not a hard word. Jerusalem <laughs> in the mid 5th century BC. Uh, rebuilding the walls surrounding Jerusalem uh, was his most important construction project. Uh, and he did that after his release from captivity by the Persian king. Also instituted extensive moral and liturgical reforms in rededicating the Jews to Yahweh. He was a lot like Gwen. He made sure his people followed God's rules with the laws of Moses. And Gwen, she made sure that her people were quite skinny. So, you know, samesies. Uh, the Remnant Fellowship Church is based on the idea that all other churches are fraudulent, phony fucking fatties. <laughs> uh, they have strayed away from God's teachings, as outlined in the Bible. What Gwen lacked in body weight, she made up for in hubris. The very name of her church is pretty elitist. It suggests that they are the only remains of the real church of God as described in the Old Testament. Although, as far as we know, Remnant Fellowship has not gone full-blown doomsday cult yet. It's ironic that the only time the idea of the remnant is used in the New, uh, New Testament is in the book of Revelations, where there is a remnant of 144,000 believers existing during the end times. How many times has that number come up in cults? So often. Uh, in addition to claiming that hers was the only genuine church of God, Gwen pissed a lot of people off by denying the Trinity. This might have upset her followers more than announcing her church was the only real one on earth. As Britannica describes it in Christianity, the Trinity is the unity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as three persons in one Godhead. The doctrine of the Trinity is considered to be one of the central Christian affirmations about God. It is rooted in the fact that God came to meet Christians in a threefold figure. One, as creator, as revealed in the Old Testament. Two, as the Lord who, in the incarnated figure of Jesus Christ, lived among human beings. And three, as the Holy Spirit whom they experience as the helper or intercessor in the power of the new life. In other words, the Trinity states that the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost are all equals. It is a fundamental, foundational Christian belief. And while founding her new church, Gwen stated that this long, long-held bedrock belief was not true and that God was the Father above all, including Jesus. Big doctrinal twist, right? Cult, cult, cult. Christianity to deny the Trinity. It's considered heresy, a sin against God. Gwen didn't see it that way. She feels so holy now, she's uh, comfortable going rogue, declaring that this long-standing biblical interpretation is incorrect. After investigating so many cults here on time, so I think it's pretty clear what's happening here. Gwen is intentionally separating herself from the mainstream church to, to place herself and thus her church above the rest of Christianity. Or, or really more than that, she is replacing the rest of Christianity with her and her church. She and her church are, are more special, more righteous, more worthy of your time and dedication than any other church. And in fact, following the doctrines of any other church will get your soul sent straight to hell. In a weekly email to Remnant on August 10th, 2000, Gwen wrote, Hello, my thin, uh, fit, beautifully bony children. And also a uh, disappointed acknowledgement to my ugly fatty still struggling with Satan who continually insist on putting their own selfish, glutton, and cellulite-filled desires ahead of the Lord's love. I sincerely hope that you get your waistline below 32 inches before you die. 
Because just like you have to be at least 48 inches tall to go on a lot of the best carnival rides at the fair, you have to be at least 32 inches small to slide in between the pearly gates, you lazy, weak-wheeled fucks. Kind of wish that was how she started her email. Uh, here's how she really started it. As a ministry, we believe in God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. However, the Bible does not use the word Trinity, and our feeling is that the word Trinity implies equality in leadership or shared leadership. It is clear that the scriptures teach that Jesus is the Son of God and that God sends the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does not send God anywhere. God is clearly the head. Boom, bitches. Mike dropped. Uh, separating herself from mainstream Christian teachings earned her a lot of haters, but also was a way of increasing her appeal and in typical zealot fashion. Everywhere she went, she spoke about her newfound revelation that God is above all as an objective truth revealed to her directly from heaven. However, that's much bullshit. Uh, this move, not about theology, as investigative journalist Stuart Watson put it, Jesus, ichthys, the fish, the cross, the Bible, the whole nine yards, it's all smoke and mirrors. This is not about theology at all. This is all a slideshow. Excuse me, slideshow? Sideshow, very different. It's about money, prestige, power. That is her holy trinity. That would take a very different turn if I said it was all about the, it's all, it's all about the slideshow. And then he just goes into a big visual presentation. Uh, as Remnant Fellowship started to grow following the big initial departure of about half her congregation, Gwen's con condemnation of the rest of the world's fraudulent churches grew more severe. In one Remnant sermon, Gwen is recorded as saying, The unrepentant gravitate quickly to the dark places, the dark churches, that do not turn on the light for the fear of offending any members, stepping on any toes, because the pain of the light of the guilt is overwhelming. Although she later denied doing so fervently for uh, legal reasons when they sued her, uh, during the same time in 2000, Gwen fired five longstanding employees at the Waydown headquarters for refusing to join her new remnant fellowship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, trying to deny your employees religious freedom is a, is a bit of a no-no. The disgruntled employees retained the help of uh, that attorney, Gary Blackburn, in a case, or, or of an attorney, Gary Blackburn, with, uh, oh my God, in a case with five uh, individual lawsuits against Gwen for infringing on their First Amendment rights of religious freedom. They would all receive settlements for undisclosed amounts. One of the former employees, Tanya Cardenti, was interviewed in an October 2000 issue of Baptist Press, where Tanya claimed not only was she fired for not converting to Gwen's new religion, but that near the end of her job, she was punished for praying at the Way Down headquarters. Tanya, who had relocated herself and her family to Nashville a couple years prior, after she got a job with Way Down, said, I used my lunch hour to pray. And I was told by Gwen that she pays other people good money to pray and she didn't need my prayers and it wasn't my place to decide what to pray for. After increasing pressure from Gwen, Tanya and her family decided to visit the Remnant Fellowship sermons at the Way Down Workshop for about two months. She said, that's when we started hearing things that we knew weren't doctrinally sound. Gwen would tell us that grace isn't the message of God and that she is a prophet. She said, the Antichrist resides in all of us. After she stopped attending Remnant, Tanya was immediately fired. Another former employee, single mother, Anita Pillow, was similarly fired from the way down for refusing to join Remnant. However, in the middle of being fired, Pillow was asked by Gwen to sign a letter saying she resigned instead of being, uh, uh, saying she resigned, which she thankfully refused to sign. Uh, during her legal de deposition with Gary Blackburn, the lawyer representing the five long-term, long-time employees at the way down headquarters, uh, fired for not becoming cult members, while describing her church and her teachings, Gwen said some weird shit. Weirdest thing she probably said was using the physical condition of concentration camp victims during the Holocaust as proof of how portion control for sure leads to weight loss. Oof. She said, when people were in prison camps and ate less food, <laughs> my God, when people were in prison camps and ate less food, they lost weight. All of them. To which Blackburn responds, Mrs. Shamblin, surely you're not making a comparison between the forced starvation of a population and middle-class Americans eating habits. Are you honestly doing that? After looking confused for a moment, then returning to her usual poise stance, Gwen answers, I have been for 15 years and a lot of people have responded. What an incredibly tone deaf thing to do here. You just have to eat less and you will lose weight, I promise. I mean, do you remember seeing pictures of any um, uh, uh, fat Jewish people in Auschwitz? Uh, what? Y you can't be serious, Gwen. I mean, no, I don't remember. I I exactly. W w why? I mean, they were all skinny. Well, I, I bet a lot of them were praying instead of stuff in their faces and God rewarded them for their prayer. Uh, what, if I, I rewarded? Uh, you know, almost all of them were mercilessly uh, killed, right? Yes, but they died skinny, sweetie. And they went to heaven. 
you know they weren't even Christian. They don't believe in your concept. Of, Stop getting hung up on the details, dear. I'm trying to make a point and save you. So uh, her analogy painfully illustrated what her diet was really based in. Starvation. Uh, this was not the only time Gwen offensively used a tragedy as a marketing tool. Also in 2000, Gwen embarked on her speaking tour around the U.S. Uh, she called Rebuilding the Wall. Uh, this uh, name was meant to symbolize her attempt to rebuild the fallen walls of the modern churches, which had lost their way and become sin-filled and compromised for God's glory. Right again, she's the new uh, Nehemiah, building walls for the new Jerusalem, the remnant fellowship. The rebuilding of the wall event in South Bend, Indiana on November 10th, 2001 was her first stop on the tour after the 9-11 attacks. According to her website during her speech, uh, Gwen had a glorious and godly perspective on the 9-11 attacks. She sounded the alarm and warned everyone that today was the day and now was the time to repent and be ready to meet God. It was time to go all the way and build up God's church so that humble, seeking, hurting people would have a place to worship God in spirit and in truth. All of the remnant members who traveled to that event were introduced to the visiting audience to present a picture of what this looked like. Skinny. And to show that lives were being changed for the better at this place. Just another example of how Gwen would use fear and anxiety in order to manipulate people into joining her church. Uh, be afraid. Trials and tribulations, y'all. America's under attack. Your town could be next. 9-11 was just the beginning, honey. Get your soul right with God. Lose that weight before it's too late, dear. Don't let your Lord ass lead you to being roasted and cooked down in hell by its unholy shift, Satan. Another marketing tactic she used uh, was weaponizing the very thing that she built her empire on. Weight loss. Gwen started preaching that people still participating in the Way Down workshops at churches that weren't remnant were gaining all of their weight back because they were in a false church. A lot of these other churches, unsurprisingly, were now rejecting Gwen's teachings and would no longer sell her Way Down program. That was okay with Gwen. She was building more congregations of her own now. The Remnant Fellowship Congregation in Nashville was still growing, still being hosted in her Way Down corporate headquarters or at her mansion home. And satellite churches around the U.S. began popping up in the wake of wherever Gwen would stop on the Rebuild the Wall tour. 2003, Gwen purchased a 40-acre plot of land to build the massive Remnant Fellowship Church in Brentwood, Tennessee, less than a mile from Gwen's 25-acre, seven-bedroom plantation home called Ashlawn. Brentwood is a predominantly white, affluent neighborhood with a high cost of living. In 2003, sermons continued to be held at Ashlawn, but as the church neared completion, more and more events began to be held in its hallowed halls. Even after the church was built, Ashlawn continued to serve as an event hall for the church and its members. Almost all remnant weddings are held there. First wedding held there was for Elizabeth Shambling, Gwen's daughter, and Brandon Hanna, a marriage that Gwen may have arranged. Although Remnant denies that it enforces arranged marriages, in one former member's testimony, she describes a conversion, or excuse me, describes a conversation uh, she had with Gwen and a few of the other leaders while working on the Rebuild the Wall tour. Another conversation we had at dinner surrounded surrounded around the youth group. Gwen talked about which girl in the group should be with what guy. She even talked about Elizabeth being with Brandon. Conversation was such that Gwen was having everyone try and convince Elizabeth that she needed to date Brandon. She even tried to get us to tell Elizabeth that Brandon would get better looking the older he got. Later, my husband and I discussed that apparently Gwen was matching the youths up as couples. We wondered if they were going to be arra- if there were going to be arranged marriages in Remnant and even talked about that possibly happening. The whole conversation made us very uncomfortable. Uh, soon after getting uh, married, Elizabeth and Brandon would have a baby girl named Henley. But five months later, uh, baby Henley would die in her sleep. And so weird, no one acknowledged this death uh, to the congregation. Not Elizabeth, not Brandon, not Gwen. According to multiple sources, this is the norm at Remnant. Grieving is not allowed, especially for something as tragic and abrupt as losing a child. Because the image of grief is incompatible with the image that they try so desperately to put out there to the world. That their church is heaven on earth all members are blessed and happy all the time and, and hungry. So fucking hungry. Uh, so when Elizabeth lost her child, it was promptly and swiftly swept under the rug. The other reason Remnant had to do this is because their whole philosophy and dogma is based on the idea that bad things only happen to you if you're not right with God. You're only fat because you don't love God enough, right? You're having money trouble because you're putting money above God. Your marriage is falling apart because you're failing God. Sounds a lot like the mirror exercise that Jeff and Shalia Devine promoted in the, uh, and still promote in the Twin Flames universe. All Gwen talked about was that if you obey the one true church, then you will be blessed. But then her own grandchild dies at five months old. How can you reconcile that with the teaching that bad things only happen to bad people? Is death bad for the brand? 
right? Gwen was so righteous, living so free from sin, doing so much to glorify God. She was rewarded with a beautiful skinny body, wealth, a healthy family. A dead baby simply doesn't align with this prosperity gospelish view. Gwen and other leaders of the church could not draw attention to Henley's death because using the logic that they taught, people would come to the conclusion that Elizabeth or Michael or Gwen, somebody in the family, had done something very wrong for God to punish them so. So they came up with a workaround. To avoid people asking what the Shamlin Hannah family had done to deserve this, they turned the question around towards the church. Maybe somebody else had fucked them over. The leaders of the church started doing family checkups now because they knew that the Shamlin Hannah family had done nothing wrong, so they couldn't be judged by God. Therefore, had to be someone else in the church, a rat that God was upset with. Love the mental gymnastics employed in cults. Just to shoehorn fucking anything and everything into fitting inside their insane teachings. Gwen and upper members of her church's leadership now targeted congregants who they called the strugglers, i.e. people who were overweight. Because most likely it had to be one of them who brought God's judgment down upon the church and caused that baby to die. Those fuckers! They ate too many pancakes at breakfast, too many mornings. They poured too much syrup on those pancakes, ate too many delicious pork sausage links alongside those pancakes that they also probably dipped in the syrup. And, and not real maple syrup either. Super sugary, high fructose corn syrup, probably log cabin. So fucking good. And, and when they kept stuffing those pancakes and sausage and probably some scrambled eggs and maybe even biscuits uh, with some butter, real butter, uh, and some strawberry jam down their chubby, gluttonous, selfish gullets. Those fat fuckers doomed that baby to death and God had to punish him. They had to. They might as well have eaten Gwen's uh, uh, baby direct, her grandbaby directly. It, it was basically like they took that baby decapitated, gutted it, put the carcass on a spit roast over an open flame, cooked it up rotisserie style after skinning it and seeded it with some lorries and ate its tender, delicious, perfectly prepared and seasoned baby flesh along with some mashed potatoes. Real potatoes, not instant, made with a lot of butter and a bit of sour cream. Drowning in white sausage, country-style gravy, cornbread with honey, French-cut green beans, cooked up with little chunks of bacon, rubbed with some brown sugar on the side, all washed down with some fucking sweet tea. For a delicious, nutritious, family-style meal before enjoying some down-home banana cream pie with the graham cracker crust. Oh, hot damn, that was a tasty baby. Anyway. <laughs> I got a little too into that, probably. Anyway, after a baby's death. Forget about all the stuff I said about eating babies. <laughs> that was probably a lot. Elizabeth became a sunken shell of her former self, getting skinnier and skinnier, which was kind of good, because that meant God loved her more. And according to multiple former members, quieter and quieter. But don't worry, she'll bounce back. She has to. It's what's best for the brand. Uh, more importantly, her mom, Gwen, seemed fine. She had a business to run, and business was good. She had big, important services to preside over. There were also other kids in her congregation to care for. And by care for, I mean beat the shit out of. During the remnant Easter services in 2003, hundreds from all around America flocked to the Nashville church to celebrate with Gwen in person. Brentwood resident Laura Boone had a regular gig babysitting a remnant. And on that particular weekend, she was in charge of somewhere between 20, 30 younger kids while their parents attended worship. As these parents were dropping their children off, she noticed one little eight-year-old boy named Joseph Smith, not the reincarnated founder of the LDS church, if you're curious, uh, in the corner sobbing uncontrollably. Laura tracked down Joseph's dad, also named Joseph, but for the sake of clarity, we'll just call him Joe, and asked him if there was a game she could play with his son in order to calm him down, make him feel better. Making a punching motion into his fist. Joe told her to, quote, just hit him hard. She refused. And again, he repeated, no, really, just hit him hard. Again, Laura refused. So Joe took his son into a back room and Laura could hear him beating the little boy. Remember, he's eight, a third grader. And his grown ass man father is choosing to discipline him with his fists, punching him. Multiple other remnant parents witnessed the incident. No one seemed phased by it. After the beating, little Joseph and his dad came back out. Joseph was dead silent. Joe and his wife, Sonia, then headed into worship. Oh, what an intro to God. Fear God, little Joseph, for sometimes his love comes in the form of a fucking brutal ass whooping. This was the last time Laura ever babysat at the remnant. It was when she realized that blatant child abuse was not only allowed within the remnant, it was the norm. One of the foundational aspects of remnant's belief is the importance of child obedience by virtually any means necessary. In one video of Gwen speaking to dozens of children at Remnant Church, she says, quote, The way you show God that you're answering to Him is through obeying your mother and father for on the first time 
If you obey the second and third time, or you are slow to obey, you are being your own God. And nobody playing around like that can ever get to heaven. So you will only live for a few years on earth. Then you will have a horrible afterlife. If you do not obey mommy and daddy the first time, you will be taken out and you will be very, very sorry. You will be taken out. Man, that dark souled bobblehead bitch. Might have to write Chad Daybell in prison. Find out what level of demon zombie Gwen was. Gotta be at least a 4.3, right? Referencing the Lori Vallow suck if you're very confused here. Uh, seriously, though, that was some horrific shit for her to say. Essentially, Gwen's beliefs on having obedient children uh, the same as her belief on being overweight. If you're overweight, you're making the Zion God has entrusted her to build look bad. If you have disobedient children, you're making Zion look bad, making her look bad. To this day, the welcome page of the Remnant website reads, Meet the remnant of the kingdom of God, an international community of people who are finding renewed hope, profound love, and deep purpose by putting the undiluted teachings of Jesus Christ into practice. While divorce, depression, obesity, and out-of-control children are increasingly the norm these days, at the remnant, we are experiencing healed marriages, increasing joy, restored health, repaired finances, and children who love to follow the guidance of their parents. That obey your mom and dad commandment type shit, uh, it's always bothered me. It desperately needs some updating, some carve-outs, right? How about obey thy mother and father unless they're terrible fucking parents? Should Rod Farrell from last week's Florida Vampire Murder Suck have listened to his mother, Sandra? No. She was a horrible influence on him. More than 600,000 children are abused in the U.S. each year. 34% of the sexual abusers of children are family members. In 88% of cases, the perpetrator is male. So how many dads worldwide this is definitely not just a U.S. problem, are currently sexually abusing one or more of their children or physically abusing them, I would conservatively estimate hundred or estimate hundreds of thousands, if not a million or millions, probably many millions. Should those kids honor their father, follow his guidance? Should they fear eternal damnation for standing up to their abuser? And that's just the most extreme example. What about parents who say forbid their child to date someone of a different race or of a different religion? Should they fear damnation? for following their heart and not being judgmental assholes? Simple maxims like that are frankly really fucking stupid. Overly simplistic, blatantly problematic to anyone who wants to employ any critical thinking, reasonable, like in life skills. Uh, I feel sorry for any children raised in Gwen's remnant fellowship bullshit. Just abusive in so many ways. At some point after the Easter sermon in Nashville, Gwen was hosting a conference call on parenthood with remnant members from all around America. Sonia Smith was one of the members to call in about her experience following the Remnant Fellowship's advice on how to discipline her eight-year-old, that little boy we met earlier named Joseph. And this is how the conversation went. Sonia goes, uh, this is Sonia Smith in Atlanta. Sonia, says Gwen. I got to speak with Ted Anger, a high-ranking member of the church. And, and uh, that's in, you know, just to clarify who he is. And, and I did exactly what Ted told me to do and took everything out of his room. We got everything out of there and locked him in there from Friday until that Monday and only left him in the room with his Bible. And that's a miracle. You got a child that's gone from just bizarre down to in control. So I praise God. We are spoiling these kids. We are ruining their lives by letting them think about themselves at all. So thank you, Sonia, for sharing that. My God, we're ruining their lives by letting them think about themselves. What is missing in some people? Too many people where they can hear that and not think, yeah, that's fucking awful. Uh, Fuck you for even saying that dumb shit. Children are just people. People with still developing brains and physicality, not little robots you bought at some store to own forever. Right? Your job as a parent, as I see it, if you have any interest in being a good parent, is not to beat their spirit out of them and break them down. Is to, yes, establish some boundaries. Yes, sometimes discipline them. But why? So they can be your proper little obedient minions or slaves? No. So they can someday keep themselves in check, follow the rules of the society they live in and thrive instead of ended up dead or in prison because they don't understand how to to be a contributing, functioning member of society. So they can interact in a positive way with others and have healthy, high-functioning relationships, hold down jobs, raise children, and also lead positive lives, and just be happy people. Other advice that Gwen preached to her remnant followers about child discipline was to hit them on the inside of their thighs with long glue sticks, wooden spoon. This makes me want to like raise her from the dead and fucking beat her with a glue stick for about a day. Uh, with long glue sticks, wooden spoons, or belts in order to get them to behave but not break any bones. Because again... If you have a disobedient child, that means God is punishing you for not being a good enough Christian. 
And if you're not a good enough Christian, then you're making the remnant. I.e. the one true church. I.e. Gwen look bad. October 8th, 2003, eight-year-old Joseph Smith is beaten to death by his parents, which was his punishment for interrupting Gwen Shamblin's sermon. The Smiths lived in Georgia where they tuned in every Sunday to Gwen's sermons via live stream. On that particular Sunday, Joe had been continuously misbehaving. So his parents decided to do what they always did and followed Gwen's ruthless, you will be taken out and you will be very, very sorry advice on discipline. Despite Sonia and Joe claiming that their son died from a skin condition he had, court documents reveal that's not even close to the truth. This is how that Sunday went down. The record reveals that Joe and Sonia Smith routinely disciplined their son, Joseph, by beating him with glue sticks, belts, and heated coat hangers, locking him in confined spaces for extended periods of time, and tying his hands with rope. During the day on October 8th, 2003, Joe disciplined Joseph several times, striking him repeatedly with a foot-long glue stick. At one point, Joseph began complaining of severe stomach pains and had urine that was brownish in color. Later, while Joe was taking a shower, Sonia Smith beat Joseph with the glue stick, drawing blood through Joseph's clothing. Fuck, you'd have to beat somebody hard with a glue stick to do that. Sonia and the Smith's eldest son, Michael Booth, then forced Joseph into a wooden box, beating him about the head as they did so. Sonia and Michael then tied the box shut with a cord. When Joe later came out of the shower and removed Joseph from the box, the child was barely breathing. Emergency services personnel were called to the Smith's residence with an unresponsive child complaint and Joseph was taken to the hospital where he later died. Numerous medical experts examined the extensive bruising throughout Joseph's body and to Joseph's head and testified that the cause of Joseph's death was either blunt trauma, excuse me, blunt force trauma, or asphyxiation. Fuck Gwen for preaching what she preached and fuck Sonia and Joe Smith for following her teachings. If this is how God truly wants to run things, I would rather burn in hell and at least die knowing I didn't beat my kid to death. In 2004, the Remnant Fellowship Church's building is completed, and soon after that, uh, the same year, it is raided by police as part of the investigation into young Joseph's death. No evidence was found to prove that the church was directly complicit in Joseph's death, but that didn't mean that the Remnant was off the hook. Joseph's death became national news, and because Sonia uh, you know, uh, and Joe were such devout believers, that bought, uh, brought Remnant under trial in the court of public opinion. Immediately, Gwen and her church took an aggressive stance, claiming two things. One, Joseph did not die from child abuse and that Sonia and Joe were innocent. And two, that the church in no way, shape or form promoted child abuse. During an interview, when that phone conversation I read a portion of between Gwen and Sonia was played for Gwen, she claimed the recording had been altered. Uh Uh-huh. Some prophetess, how weak. And proof that none of this was ever about God or Christianity was all about Gwen. Pretty clear why Remnant went to bat for the Smiths, not because they love them as fellow congregants uh, of their church. It's because if the Smiths were guilty, that made the church look guilty. And as the one true church, right, they didn't want it to, uh, to look bad, right, to, to be seen in that light. Uh, this is a business decision. One website that the church created that's still up and running today is thesmithsareinnocent.com. A more apt name would be Gwen Shamblin is innocent.com. The website reads, when you read this website, you will see that the false accusations against the Smiths were originally initiated by ex-church members. Well, who? The police? Uh, These same individuals are continuing to do the same thing they were doing 16 years ago with no new information. Despite the allegations they made against Remnant Fellowship and against Gwen Shamblin, Laura, nothing came to fruition. They had convinced investigative reporters to do a publicized investigation, but it led to no personal investigation of Gwen Shamblin, Laura. DCS never came. The FBI never came. No one ever charged Gwen Shamblin Laura or any church leaders of anything related to child abuse or neglect at any point in the investigation. All remnant fellowship and way down materials and teachings were fully vetted by the police department. Everything was highly investigated. The police department did over a one year thorough examination of every book, pamphlet and video and audio recording yet never found one teaching that could be connected to the death of a child or to child abuse or to the murder of a child. And in the Smith trial, police testified under oath. They could not find a link between the boy's death and the church's teachings about punishment. I think this has less to do with Gwen being innocent and a lot more to do with the way that laws are written, right? Gwen's quote earlier definitely encourages child abuse. The whole, so you will only live for a few years on earth, then you will have a horrible afterlife. If you don't obey mommy and daddy the first time, you'll be taken out. You'll be very, very sorry. But the way she says this, right, you know, leaves her a lot of legal wiggle room. Even if she told congregants to hit children directly, and she did tell them that as well, by the way. She could still say in court, yeah, but I didn't mean to hit him that hard. I meant a light spanking. 
I meant, I meant take him out of the room. You know, whatever. She can wiggle out all kinds of shit. Also, for the record, while a lot of people point to the spare the rod, spoil the child verse from the book of Proverbs as justification for whooping some Christian kid ass, the uh, Bible is actually not pro-child abuse. At least a lot of it is not. Proverbs 19, 18, discipline your children, for in that there is hope. Do not be a willing party to their death. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, uh, 4 to 5, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. Galatians 5, 22 to 23, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And I could go on. People who abuse their kids never do so on behalf of God's will. God's never abused any children. Only people ever have. Uh, despite an innocent boy's death at the hands of two members, remnant fellowship continued to grow. Believers were not only tuning in online like the Smiths did, but dozens were relocating their families now to Brentwood in order to be closer to Gwen and the church. As an incentive for people to move there, members already living in Brentwood were opening up their homes to those who were, were relocating. And it was not uncommon for two or even three remnant families to be living under one roof at the time of Joseph's death. This was the beginning of remnant becoming completely self-sufficient, isolated from the outside world, right? Cult, cult, cult. Not only were members heavily encouraged to live within a 10 block radius of the church, they were encouraged to only go to other remnant members for any goods or services they may need. As one anonymous former member put it in the HBO docuseries, for years, there has been encouragement to have everything created, everything accessible from within. No longer do many people have to go outside to get dentistry services, to get a pulmonologist or to get their hair done, get Botox, to get their car fixed. Cult, cult, cult. All right, by this time within the church, congregants already had access to a real estate company, financial planning services, car service, beauty salon, plumbing, electrical services, and more. And of course, it was only at Remnant and through Gwen, they could get the most important service of all, the Way Down Workshop. All members of Rem Remnant were and still are to this day aggressively encouraged to be in the Way Down Workshop at all times. And you guessed it, this was and is not free for church members. You still had to, still have to pay for it. Backing up to 2004 again, despite his new tendrils at the heart of Gwen's church, was still weight loss. And her convictions about it were growing more and more severe. Uh, Spirit Watch Ministries offers us a glimpse of the extent to which Gwen abused and manipulated her congregants during this period and beyond. In 2004, an essay titled Our Experience with Remnant, written by ex-leaders of the church, Mark and Laura Nichols, was published on Spirit Watch's website. Their essay, just one of many written by ex-Remnant members on the site, posted alongside many articles written by the site's director, Reverend Rafael Martinez who, as I've mentioned, uh, um, you know, talks about how Remnant functions as a cult. In our experience with Remnant, Laura describes how after seven years of working for the Way Down Workshop and being a devout member of Remnant since its inception, she was forced to resign publicly by Gwen for not losing weight fast enough. According to Laura, out of the blue, Gwen told her, Hey, what's going on? Tons of fun. Uh, just get, you just got back from bankrupting the buffet? Or, or is that just how you look all the time now? <laughs> I'm just kidding, chubby checkers. I mean, Laura. Uh, wait, are you Laura? Or did you eat Laura and somehow absorb some of her physical appearance? <laughs> That's not what Gwen said. Uh, actually, uh, I adapted that last part from a comment someone once left about me. Uh, when I made some early stand-up appearances on Comedy Central, I was, I was very thin. And then years later, someone commented under another video about how I looked like I'd eaten my younger self. And I thought that was pretty funny. I was about 70 pounds lighter. <laughs> 160 compared to, you know, somewhere between 235 and 240. I don't care. Gwen would though. Uh, here's what Gwen really said to Laura. Let me tell you, Laura, that I was shocked when I saw you in Houston and that you had not lost any more weight that you have since this past summer. There's no reason why you've not lost your weight. Your weight should be coming off at nearly 10 pounds per week. Laura, I'm scared for you. Now, remember, Laura, I could not be saying this to you if I didn't love you so much. 10 pounds per week? No. Nah. Uh, the CDC, Centers for Disease Control, recommends losing one to two pounds per week. That's the healthy rate for weight loss. The Mayo Clinic also recommends not losing more than two pounds per week. The U.S.'s uh, National Institutes of Health also recommends the same amount, as do many, 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 many other medical, governmental, uh, and or health and wellness agencies around the world. I couldn't find anyone other than other crackpots pushing for 10 pounds per week or more in weight loss. Gwen continued by saying, uh, <laughs> Mark, which is uh, Laura's husband, you ought to be getting after her every time she's disobedient. You ought to love her enough and be scared enough to understand that if she dies, she is lost. And you should be doing all you can do not to let this overindulgence with food continue. Mark, I want you to put Laura on the scales every week. Oh, my God. And call me with her weight loss. 
Lord, I want you to get up in front of that Houston remnant and confess your sin of greed of food for them and tell them that you're going to step down in leadership and show them who your God really is. Laura, get the weight off. I also want you to find someone in your WDA group to take over your class and step down as coordinator. Lord, I should have put a stop to you five years ago and I didn't. You should have never had this weight on your body this long, but I love you and I want to help you. Please understand, Laura, that I could only say these things to you because I love you. I want the best for you. God, Gwen loved Laura. This is all about love and not about protecting the brand and making sure that Gwen didn't have any fatties in her inner circle, making her clients, I mean, congregation, question her divine weight loss claims. Thankfully, soon after this incident uh, and forced public humiliation, uh, Laura and her husband decided to do some digging on their own, began doing what they were told to avoid at all costs. They began to read about how the outside world viewed and understood remnant. And it quickly became crystal clear they were in a cult and needed to get out. However, as it always does, getting out would come at a great cost. Not only did they lose all their friends, their jobs, their lives as they knew them, they were also subjected to further public embarrassment when Gwen sent out an email to the entire remnant community calling out the two ex-members by name. In an email dated Wednesday, February 6, 2003, uh, at 3 p.m., with the subject line of, God is moving. Gwen wrote the following. Dear precious remnants, good afternoon. I just wanted to let you all know that I love you all very much. I'm very proud of you all and your efforts to crown God as the rightful sovereign that he is and to further his kingdom territory. I have just a quick bit of information for all of you about some recent purging that God has done. Ezekiel 20, 38 says, I will purge you of those who revolt and rebel against me. This means that only those that want God to rule and love that way will be left on his holy hill. Of course, you all know that Satan is very upset about our sincere effort to let God be the only God in our lives. And he's constantly trying to confuse the saints. But you must be grounded on the word of God. The apostle Paul would name names of people that the lambs of God, the saints, needed to stay away from. See, 2 Timothy 2.17. Just recently, two families have pulled off from the remnant fellowship due to their strong desire to keep their strongholds. They are now trying to call other remnant fellowships online about what we said or did. That is all that they can find on us. Like Paul, I will also mention names. The families I'm referring to are redacted. And Mark and Laura Nichols. We have loved these two families very much, but they have chosen to leave based on lies. They are actually calling up remnant members and claiming that remnant is a cult. The one church clearing God's temple of idols and clearing the way so that God rules is the only place that is not a cult. How vague and how unfair and how unchristian not to take their complaint to the leaders. Both have refused to talk to the leaders, yet we have tried. They all have more of a heart for people that are kissing idols than for poor God who has had to share glory with deaf and dumb idols. They have no respect for people that are clearing the temple of false gods after seven years of knowing Laura as a coordinator and then as a remnant member I loved on her and urged her strongly to lay down the food idol for I was afraid for her. She had called her office and said that this was too hard and that she had put on weight. I asked her to give up leadership so that she could concentrate on herself. Sometimes when serving others, we can deceive ourselves that we are okay with God, even if we do not teach ourselves. Fair enough after no weight loss in seven years. The only weight loss ever achieved from a stomach bypass before way down. My first suggestion after seven years of her teaching my classes was not received. You all know that total sovereignty is the only way to go. Total obedience to the one true God is the only way to go. I urge you all not to take phone calls from these families. By the way, this is not surprise some of us, for we could sense their side ways, their side ways is, should not be two words, but she wrote it as such, allegiance to each other and people over God. We must put Him first. He is testing all of us. Do not be discouraged, dear friends. Some people may turn from the truth, but you are all firmly grounded. In the true Jesus that said, no fatties, no fat chicks in heaven. I'm I just kidding. Not my will, but yours be done. So keep at it. You all are doing so wonderfully. I love you beautiful skinny motherfuckers. 
I may have added that last part. Uh, Gwen's church, the only church that is not a cult. Way to flip the narrative. You're not in a cult. You're the only people on earth not in a cult. Gosh dang. Gwen's cult leader game getting strong. Uh, smart move not to make the descent about her, right? Uh, these two families, they're not criticizing her. They're criticizing God. Whew. Telling that to people very worried about their salvation, that's a, that's a powerful move. Gwen makes it real clear that if anyone takes the side of these two defecting families, they're not going against her. They're directly going against God, which places their immortal souls in grave danger. Excuse me. Uh, Laura's story, by no means unique. Uh, some members who couldn't lose, I do find it ironic. <laughs> My stomach's making all crazy noises because I haven't ate much because of that doctor stuff uh, as I'm talking about this stuff. Uh, some members who couldn't lose weight were told to uh, quit eating entirely <laughs> or else they'd be kicked out of the church. Because if they're overweight, that means they're not being a good enough Christian. And only the best of the best are allowed in the remnant. God wants his earthly army to be a thin, sexy, ripped army. Think uh, Demi Moore and G.I. Jane. Uh, Brad Pitt and the Glorious Bastards. Satan can have the, the, the flab and the beer gut crew. Think John Candy and Stripes. Uh, Vincent uh, <laughs> D'Onofrio in Full Metal Jacket. June 15, 2006, three years after their son's death, Sonia and Joseph Smith are indicted for one count of malice murder, three counts of felony murder, five counts of first-degree cruelty to children, three counts of aggravated assault, and two counts of false imprisonment. I like it. Court going hard on these motherfuckers. Following year on what would have been Joseph's 12th birthday, February 16, 2007, a state court grand jury found his parents, Joseph and Sonia Smith, guilty of beating him to death. The eight-day-long trial, known as Smith versus State, Included testimony from the three Cobb County firemen who first responded to Smith's 911 or 911 call about Joseph, five Cobb County police officers, the little boy's former babysitter, his older brother Michael, and several medical experts. And poor Michael being pressured to do this shit too. All uh, although they were represented by separate counsels, the husband and wife were tried together. Their lawyers conducted a joint defense. Joint defense primarily led by Sonia's criminal defense lawyer Manny Aurora, whose substantial legal fees were paid for by Remnant Fellowship. According to his website, Aurora specializes in defending those convicted of homicide, robbery, embezzlement, bank fraud, insurance fraud, bribery, and other white-collar crimes. During her closing argument, prosecutor Eleanor Dixon requested for the lights of the courtroom to be dimmed. She then produced a small birthday cake and began lighting each of the eight candles placed on top. Looking down at the cake, she proceeded to sing Happy Birthday, Dear Joseph in honor of what would have been his 12th birthday. That is intense. That is very sad. And that is a fucking brilliant prosecutorial move. Woo, man. Hail Eleanor, right? Put these fuckers away. During the entire prosecution, Sonia and Joseph had remained impassive, stoic. But when Dixon started to sing happy birthday to their dead son, the son they beat to death, they began to sob hysterically. Good. According to court documents, after blowing out the candles, the prosecutor spoke directly to the jury and said, there are eight candles on that cake. But you know what's not on there? One more candle for his ninth birthday because he didn't get to see that. You may think that's harsh, but it's true. And it was at the hands of those people pointing at the parents. Several members of Remnant attended the trial, although they made no comments to any of the media outlets and newspapers. March 27, 2007, Sonia and Joseph Smith are convicted of felony murder, sentenced to life in prison, plus another 30 years for involuntary manslaughter, cruelty to children, aggravated assault, and reckless conduct. Joseph, currently serving time at the Macon State Prison in Oglethorpe, Georgia. His wife at the Airedale State Prison for women in Rowell, Georgia. And the only way those two fuck faces will ever get out is a presidential or gubernatorial pardon, and that will never happen, so they will die in prison. Albeit virtually and from prison, both uh, to this day, still active members of the Remnant Fellowship Church. Also to this day, maintain they are innocent, as does their gross-ass church. So much easier, psychologically speaking, to double down on a terrible lie and then to take responsibility for a terrible truth. Uh, so where's Tarzan? Uh, we haven't connected with his phony grift and ass in a little while. 2010, Laura and his longtime on-again, off-again romantic interest, Natasha Pavlovich, get back together for the final time. And soon afterwards, on November 19th of that year, they welcome the baby girl, Liana Laura, to the world. After her birth, they decide to move from California to Nashville, Tennessee, where after not having made any headway as a model or actor in over a decade, Joe can pursue his last-ditch effort to become truly famous as a country music star now. Mm -hmm. Natasha agreed to move to Tennessee on one condition. Uh, if by the time their daughter reaches five years old, that Joe hasn't made any progress in becoming the next Tim McGraw, they'll move to Chicago, where Natasha has family, and both she and Joe could hopefully find city work, you know, guest starring in police procedurals, stuff like that. 
2011, Joe releases a country album called The Cry of Freedom. It wasn't released on any music labels, uh, did not chart. Here's a bit of the title song, Cry of Freedom. The people cry out for freedom. I hear them call my name. I hear the cry of freedom. Won't let them live. Won't let them die. (laughs) I wish that was in the song. Uh, It wasn't nearly as bad as I hoped. Uh, If I heard him singing that in the corner of a Mexican bar, you know, restaurant, or like a Holiday Inn, you know, hotel, bar lounge, I'd be impressed. Uh, The Nashville music industry, though, not impressed. Five years came and went. Joe did not make any money in music. Probably lost some uh, money recording. Uh, Didn't want to move. Didn't want to get a job either. Didn't want Natasha to move to Chicago either. So, in 2015, Joe Laura files a false claim to the police that his girlfriend and mother of his child has sexually abused their daughter. This guy was a real piece of shit. While their daughter watched, police apprehended Natasha and took her in for some questioning. After investigating her, Joe, and their five-year-old, police realized Joe was full of shit. In the HBO docuseries, Natasha said, Since that day, he never looked at me in my eyes again. Joe and Natasha parted ways, sharing custody 50-50. Not wanting to be far away from her daughter, Natasha remained in Nashville, and Joe, without his ex to support him now, uh, she had some money, begrudgingly got a job doing occasional work as a handyman. You know, sucked. But three years later, he landed a job doing uh, a few repairs at Remnant Fellowship Church, where Tarzan met Gwen Shamblin and soon fell in love. I wonder what that's uh, how that's affecting some of you guys' listening uh, uh, pets. <laughs> what do the dogs think of Tarzan's yell? Uh, yeah, he fell in love or he saw the best opportunity to seduce an older lady into being the greatest meal ticket he'd ever had. 2018, the year 63-year-old Gwen Shamblin met 55-year-old Tarzan. She divorces her longtime husband, David Shamblin. They've been married for 40 years. And God's prophetess, torchbearer for his one true church, marries grifting has-been and serial user of older women, Joe Lara, just four weeks later. According to multiple sources, for the previous three decades, Gwen had been consistently preaching that divorce was never, literally never an option, even in cases that the Bible would allow it, such as with infidelity. However, as soon as she got a little taste of that Tarzan dick, (laughs) it goes on longer than I expect every time. Uh, She was now preaching an entirely new tune. Pretty funny how that works. For many years now, really since 2003, David Shamblin had been only a a background character in The Remnant. And why was he a a background character? Well, he was fat. Seriously. He was quite overweight. Looking at pictures, I would guess anywhere from 60, 70 to 100 pounds. So his wife, Gwen, hid him, would not allow him on stage. He embarrassed her. So fucked up. Also, so funny that the skinny guru, God's prophetess, who built an empire on being thin means being righteous, was married to a man who seemed to love cake more than Jesus. Uh, The same went for Gwen's son, Michael. According to multiple sources, Gwen's eldest fluctuated in his weight quite a bit. I mean, they probably had some genetic shit going on. When he was skinny, he was placed front and center at church functions, led the choir, directed musicals. When he was overweight, you just never saw him. She was evil. She was an evil, terrible human being. So many people say uh, you're not supposed to wish death on anyone or be happy that someone has died. I don't give a flying fuck, pun intended, that she died in a plane crash. I think it's great. Uh, Unlike her ex-husband of 40 years, her new beau, Joe Laura, prepped and primed for her spotlight. In fact, the spotlight was all he'd ever wanted. He was, by Gwen's standards, fit, good-looking. I mean, he was still very fit and good-looking. And to top it all off, every bit as fake as she was. More than willing to play the role of a God-fearing, righteous man to give him a little bit of fame, wealth, and, you know, so he never had to work a real job again. He was the prop that Gwen needed, and she was his ticket to stardom. Maybe best of all for Joe, Renner Fellowship had a recording studio on site. Uh, In August of 2018, Gwen Shamblin and Joe Laura joined together in holy or unholy matrimony, perhaps. Uh, You can watch highlights uh, because they're on YouTube. Gwen still has a channel. Uh, The wedding venue was Remnant Fellowship Church, and the dress code was black tie. And unless you were Gwen, your clothes had to be all black. Prior to Gwen's magical ascension down the aisle in front of 1,500 guests, plus those watching at home via live stream. A procession of probably 30 to 50 little girls wearing old world frilly white dresses and holding candles lit the way for her. Then, as if the heavens themselves split open to give forth an angel into this decaying earth, the chapel doors swing open, revealing Gwen's silhouette. 
outlined by the light poured in from the outside. Very, very dramatic. This angel on earth is wearing a strapless white lace corset, synced as tight as God will allow. A massive tall skirt that looks less like a wedding dress and more like something a Mexican teenage girl would wear to her quinceanera. Interestingly, as you can tell by watching the documentary or just by looking at a few photos of her from the last 30 years, as Remnant grew larger and larger, Gwen ditched her modest clothing and started dressing less and less like a preacher's wife and more like uh, either a five-year-old in a baby doll sundress or a 21-year-old in a metallic bodycon dress with spaghetti straps. Very little in between. And as many former members pointed out after her death, no one was allowed to criticize Gwen on how provocatively she'd begun to dress because if you criticize Gwen, that meant you were criticizing God because she was, of course, God's chosen prophetess. Anyway, back to the knockoff royal wedding. Gwen's hair was fucking gigantic, as it always was in the last 10 or even 20 years of her life. Just as big, I never understand these haircuts. Just this big uh, televangelist beehive meets 80s glam rock nest of hairsprayed locks and extensions, easily two to three times the size of her actual head. And she's covered in body glitter. The couple say their vows in front of a massive jumbotron, or at least Joe does. Gwen either remained silent or her vows were edited out of the highlight reel. So the guests all the way in the back could see just how perfect and holy Gwen and Joe were together. Joe, who had never been religious prior to meeting Gwen, tells her the following in their vows. And before this unbelievable family of saints, uh huh, to become your husband. Oh, God, yeah. I have found my calling in life, mm. and it is to be by your side. Yes. And I will never forsake it. Yes. I vow to only look forward with you into this incredible journey that the Lord has in store for uh-huh, us. Uh-huh. And if the dark forces should ever manifest themselves against us, I vow to never stand behind oh, you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I'll be in front of you. Oh. From what I can tell, Joe was never a religious man ever prior to meeting Gwen. That's all an act. <laughs> Following their holy matrimony, Gwen and Joe uh, began ta- uh, ta- taking, excuse me, more and more romantic trips together. Uh, so, you know, Tarzan could fucking knock his new wife's back out. <laughs> and they were spending less and less time at the church. That's such a crazy yell. They also decided to start their own YouTube channel called Life with Gwen and Joe, The Preacher and the Pilot. And it's terrible. Not even so bad. It's, it's funny. It's just bad. It's just unwatchable. Oh, uh, also, did I mention that Joe was a pilot? <laughs> I think I did. And he was uh, worse at flying than he was at acting, modeling, or music. Before moving on, how about a clip from their final video, published November 20th, 2020, titled, Honoring the Christian Martyrs. Just hold Life hands. with God is uh, so good. Yes. So come join us on this fun life where we put God in the center uh-huh. of everything. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Woo! This weekend we are celebrating All Saints Day, and what what is so interesting about this is that Halloween actually was All Hallows Eve, which is a complete different day than what it is now. This is another example of how, in in in, in our culture, yeah, Joe. many. Holy days have been turned into holidays and kind of changed the definition and meaning of things. And I find it very interesting um, that they did that. That Satan's done that. Right. It's so sad because it was God's day and it was a day that every every year on November 1st, which is October 31st in America, um, so the Hebrew calendar starts at twilight. Well, bottom line, what happened was that it turned into goblins and, and graveyards and, and the Grim Reaper. Uh, they're both wrong. <laughs> uh, by the way, Joe looks super uncomfortable in this video. A little nervous. Like, he, you know, he just keeps looking to Gwen for approval. Like, he's worried about fucking this up because he probably doesn't know scripture very well at all. Yeah, and they are wrong. Uh, Halloween comes from Samhain, mainly, a Celtic festival marking the end of summer, the harvest season, and the Celtic New Year. And it predates the Christian All Saints Day by well over a thousand years. Peter Tukowski, an assistant professor in the Department of Folklore and Mythology in UCLA, states the earliest trace of Halloween is the Celtic festival, Samhain, which was the Celtic New Year. It was the Day of the Dead, and they believed the souls of the deceased would be available. Yeah, oftentimes with, uh, you know, our religion, it's not, you know, these newer, comparatively, religions 
uh, being taken over by pagan beliefs, it's the exact opposite. Pagan beliefs were there first and then were taken over by, you know, uh, like Christian beliefs, for example. But who gives a fuck about real history? <laughs> who cares about the truth? When we can just make up what feels best, you know, and uh, upholds our worldview the most and just call it a day. Numerous ex-members have questioned the legitimacy of Joe becoming one of the highest ranking members in the church immediately after marrying Gwen. Ben Bean, who was a member from 2002 to 2019, said in the documentary, to me, Joe Lara is a bot and paid for by Gwen Shamblin escort. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds accurate. August of 2020, Joe Lara and Gwen Shamblin go up against Joe's baby mama, Natasha Pavlovich, in an eight and a half day hearing in an attempt for the charlatan weasels to get full custody of Joe's daughter. Although she had already paid over $200,000 in legal fees, ugh, Natasha had gotten nowhere with lawyers and decided to defend herself during the hearing. Joe and Gwen's legal fees were, of course, paid for by Remnant, and they were represented by attorney Jason Watley, who oftentimes represented Remnant men in custody hearings when their wives wanted to leave the church. Prior to the start of the hearing, Joe and Gwen had filed for a motion uh, in limine, motion in limine, Latin for at the threshold, which banned Natasha for talking about Remnant or introducing evidence about how abusive Remnant is during the trial. In the end, the judge decided that the custody agreement would remain the same 50-50. Very interestingly, after the ruling, Natasha would get a phone call from Gwen and Joe's lawyer, Jason Wally, which she did record. And over the phone, Jason said to her, you did a hell of a job in court. I've never seen anybody that wasn't a lawyer do anything close to that. And you know, it's just a shame that you guys, you know, you have a beautiful little girl and I know it's been hell. And I know both of you would probably raise your hand and say, I've done things and said things that I shouldn't have or whatever. But I had a long talk with Joe and he wants to put all this behind him and figure out how to end the fighting. Natasha responded by saying, I think he could start by admitting there was no sexual abuse by me, to which Watley said, I think he would readily admit that. Uh, Natasha was planning to go back to court and attempt to get full custody of her daughter, Liana, later. She was very worried about the cult brainwashing of her daughter that was going on. Hello, future eating disorders and so much more. But then Gwen and Joe, out of the blue, uh, they did go ahead and just give full custody to Natasha. Uh, well, maybe they didn't like, you know, they didn't explicitly give it, but they did something that allowed Natasha to have full custody of all the same. They did her a huge favor. Uh, they did the world uh, a huge favor and uh, they died. May 29th, 2021, Gwen Shamblin Lara dies in a plane crash alongside her husband, Joe Lara, her son-in-law, Brandon Hanna, and church leaders, Jennifer and David Martin and Jessica and Jonathan Walters. That morning, the seven remnant members boarded Gwen's private plane, a Cessna 501 with Joe as the pilot, they departed from the Smyrna, Tennessee airport and were meant to land in Palm Beach, Florida later that day to attend the We the People Patriots Day MAGA rally. If anyone was qualified to help make America great again, I mean, it was definitely, you know, these two dipshits. Shortly after taking off, the plane crashed into the very shallow Percy Priest Lake in Tennessee. Everyone on board died immediately upon impact. Curiously, witnesses nearby heard a strange noise right before the plane hit the water. You know what I should do. Ah, uh, come on. I know it's stupid, but I was looking forward to doing that the entire episode. Then just as they uh, did with the death of Elizabeth's five-month-old daughter two decades prior, the church, in essence, just pretended like the crash never happened. Baffling to understand how a group could sweep something as monumental as the sudden death of six of their most important figureheads, including their founder and prophetess. A clinical psychologist explains it as best they can in the HBO docuseries, saying, a lot of what cults often do in situations like this is very Orwellian. It will be almost ignored because it does not fit their narrative that their leader was struck down in an accident that God could have protected her from. If the righteous are protected by the hand of God, how could Gwen die like that? So they just ignore it. On the day of the crash, Elizabeth Shamblin sent out a message to all remnant members saying that her mother, stepfather, husband, and three others were involved in a small controlled landing. Controlled landing! Ah! Over Percy Priest Lake. And that prayers were appreciated. <laughs> They, they controlled it. It was a very controlled, uh, it was a fast landing. They It was a hard, it was a hard landing. Controlled. Uh, God must have told them that they, it was time for him to take them to heaven and wanted them to crash the plane. So that's what they did. Uh, she told him not to cry. Everyone would for sure be going to heaven. Not a single fatty on the flight. Hallelujah. Salvation assured. She didn't, of course, say that. Uh, her mom might have said that if Elizabeth had died, though. Uh, that same day, May 29th, 2021, a remnant wedding was still held at Gwen's massive estate, Ashlon. According to the parents of the bride who were not remnant members, they were in shock regarding how the other guests and bridal party behaved, knowing that their leader had just died, violently died. 
Nevertheless, everyone just danced, sang, celebrated. Few people probably beat the ever-loving fuck out of their kids. Uh, no one had more than a few bites of cake, I'm guessing. No one acknowledged the fact that something monumental had just happened. No one acknowledged the fact that Gwen Shamlin had died that morning. Gwen had always taught them that the righteous would be rewarded and that sins would be punished and the sinful. No one could acknowledge Gwen's death, right? Because again, if they did, they would have to face another more terrifying question. How could she, uh, or excuse me, what could she have possibly done to receive such punishment? Not long, not, oh my God, my tongue. Not long after her mother and her husband's death, Elizabeth Shamblin Hannah puts her Brentwood home up for sale and moves into Ashlawn. Is she taking over the cult? Time will tell. Four months after the crash on September 30th, 2021, HBO releases the first three episodes of its five-part docuseries titled The Way Down by uh, directed by Marina Zenovich. That same day, the Remnant Fellowship releases a statement denying the allegations of abuse made in the HBO docuseries. A portion of the statement reads, on behalf of Remnant Fellowship Church and the teachings of Gwen Lara, we vehemently deny that Gwen has ever taught anything that would support child abuse in any form. Over the last 20 years, countless celebrities and public figures have had to endure allegations of child abuse, eating disorders, sexual abuse, and more. While many of these situations might be accurate, there are definitely situations where people are falsely accused. In today's society, everyone should be highly discerning regarding anything they see on any media. We insist that the allegations made against our church are completely false and defamatory. Our church's services and assemblies are webcast each week and viewed by people all around the world at no cost. Anyone seeking to learn more is always welcome to visit anytime online or in person. This is a place full of love and mercy with welcome, open arms to everyone around the world as long as they have a body fat of no more than, than 20%, I mean max, and, and they're willing to get that percentage down to, to no more than 8% in, in no more than 12 months. While Jesus might love everyone, his dad hates husky boys and fat chicks. Uh, I added those last few sentences. You, you knew that. April 28th, 2022, HBO releases the last two episodes of the Way Down documentary series. And on May 19th, 2023, at 68 years old, Gwen's ex-husband, David Shamblin, dies of unknown causes. Crazy that as heavy as he was, he did outlive his skinny prophetess ex-wife. It's almost like nothing she preached was true. March 23rd, 2023, the National Transportation Safety Board files a report for the 2021 accident over Percy Lake and reveals that the crash was indeed caused by pilot error. <laughs> I hope at least a few of you have enjoyed that uh, button as much as I have, and that is it for today's timeline. Good job, soldier. You've made it back. Barely. And now before a quick recap, a really, really cool new sponsor. Uh, just perfect for this episode. From the ancient, wise, and mysterious Count Von Count, it's the Vampire Diet, bleeding your way to skinny. Hello, it is I, the Count, and I've created the world's greatest weight loss program. Did you know that 7% of your weight is blood? And did you know that your body can replenish a pint of blood in just over uh, 24 hours, which is more than a pound? I want to suck your blood to help you lose weight. One pint of blood I suck and one pound you lose that day. Two pints of blood I suck when you return the next day. Three pints of blood I suck when you come back a third day. Ah, ah, ah. And if this is not enough, I use my fangs to tear open your stomach and eat your last few meals and gorge myself on so much delicious fat. You lose so much weight while I feast and even more while you heal. Ah, ah, ah. Let me suck you and then let me eat you. I'm totally serious. I'm not fucking around like I do on Sesame Street. This is the real count you're hearing right now. No censors, real vampire shit. No fucking around. Try my vampire diet today by dialing 1-800-246-8255. Ah, ah, ah. Ah, ah, ah. Ah, ah, ah. Just do it. Call it. See what happens. Uh, everyone has a side hustle. Even count one even count. One count. Uh, interesting new cult twist today, right? God wants you to be skinny. To stop worshiping food. Just when I think I've heard it all. We find some story like this. 
Uh, I wonder what Gwen would have thought of someone becoming super, super fit using her twisted logic. Like a bodybuilder. Someone who has to really focus on what they eat. Make sure they get enough grams of protein every day, you know, spaced out in certain intervals. Uh, make sure they hit certain caloric benchmarks. Someone who needs to rigidly, consistently take a variety of supplements, spend hours in the gym uh, every single week to build up an unnatural amount of muscle mass while also keeping their body fat very, very low. Doesn't that person focus way more on food? Worship it in a sense. Far more than the person who does not work out and just makes, you know, thoughtless, easy, low lift, you know, kind of lazy food choices. I mean, someone grabbing a lot of fast food, high sugar snacks might not actually think that much about food at all. They just grab what's cheap, readily available, tastes good, you know, easy. They don't devote nearly the focus to their diet as a bodybuilder does or, or someone like a CrossFit athlete. You know, what about worshiping the gym? Guessing a Christian bodybuilder spends a lot more time if they're any good at bodybuilding at the gym than they do at church. Does that mean they worship the gym more than God? Shouldn't God be jealous of how much they love the gym? Extending this further, uh, what about professional athletes? Don't they, using Gwen's logic or lack thereof, love their sport, dedicate more hours of training to their sport than they do towards worshiping the Lord? Should God be jealous of their chosen profession? Speaking of professions, should God be jealous of all professions his faithful spend more time focusing on than they do on worship, which is probably most of the faithful a great deal? doesn't take much effort to expose Gwen's entire theology as being completely nonsensical, fucking ludicrous, just a bunch of bullshit. There's no logic to it. Want to not get caught up in a cult? Just ask yourself, does this belief system actually make any sense? Why would God choose this person to be their prophet? Does it not feel right? It doesn't because it isn't. Don't focus on who else is in the cult. Don't let a big group of attractive, fit, happy people fool you. Anybody can drink the Kool-Aid or more accurately, flavor aid. Instead, just, you know, just try your best to get logical. Does what they say make sense? Do their demands, rules feel fair? Does any of it seem healthy? No, then fucking run. Run your full-figured, sweet cushion for the pushing beautiful ass off and fuck those skinny, bobble-headed bitches. Hail Nimrod. Fuck Gwen Shamblin Lara. Rest in peace, as much peace as you gave your followers, which was none. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, uh, the Way Down Workshop was started in 1984 by dietitian Gwen Shamblin. It was based on the concept of intuitive eating and taught followers that they should only eat when they feel hunger pains. If they ate before then, well, that's overindulgence. That's a sin. Therefore, displeasing to God. The phrase Gwen used repeatedly to describe her program was that she was teaching people to stop bound down to the refrigerator and start bound back down to God. Number two, in 1999, Gwen Shamblin establishes the Remnant Fellowship Church based on her way down scam, I mean philosophy, and uh, belief that Gwen, I mean God, is above all. Initially, Remnant members met in the back of the Way Down Workshop headquarters until 2004 when the construction of their church was completed. Since its earliest days, Remnant has been controversial for the way it is denied the Trinity, which is considered heresy uh, in the Christian doctrine. But it was brought under fire even more in 2003 when two church members beat their eight-year-old child to death using discipline tactics taught to them by Gwen Shamblin and other church leaders. Number three, in 2018, Gwen Shamblin divorced her husband of 40 years, remarried a fellow con artist named Joe Laura, uh, Lara that she'd only met weeks earlier. Joe was a failed actor and model, Current aspiring country music star, he had a history of using older women for money, and it seemed pretty clear to everyone outside the church that he was now doing the same thing with Gwen. Only this time, he started playing the role of devout Christian to pull it all off. Number four, on May 29th, 2021, Gwen Shamblin, Joe Lara, five other high-ranking members of the uh, Remnant Fellowship were killed in a plane crash caused by Joe. In classic Remnant fashion, the church essentially ignored their deaths after they happened in order to keep up the facade that they are God's chosen people and that the righteous will be blessed. Number five, new info prior to their deaths, Gwen and Joe had made a pilot episode for a reality television show, uh, provisionally called Way Down South. The show, should it have come to fruition, was meant to make Gwen and Joe's uh, uh, glorious stars of daytime reality TV. A few clips of the pilot are featured in the HBO docuseries. In one, Gwen says, I, I help a lot of women in marriages. I'm a, I'm a real believer in, in the women having their role and just letting the men be men. And how fun it is to be you know, submissive and and all that kind of stuff to play the role of of the woman is beautiful. Such a shame that the show never aired. And I could have maybe tricked Lindsay into watching it. Maybe, just maybe. 
Grand Shamblin' Laura, Lord's boniest prophetess, with more hair than even Moses, could have finally convinced her to submit to my rightful authority. But alas, it wasn't meant to be, and I continue to have a partner who believes in her right to exercise free will. Sigh. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Skinny folks go to heaven. <laughs> the Remnant Fellowship cult has been sucked. Thank you to the Bad Magic Productions team for help making time suck. Starting with Queen of Bad Magic, Lindsay Cummins, running operations. Logan Keith, recording this episode, designing merch for the store at badmagicproductions.com. Molly Jean Box, providing initial research. Also, thank you to the All-Seeing Eyes, moderating the Cult of the Curious private Facebook page, the Mod Squad, making sure Discord keeps running smooth, and everyone on the Time Sucks subreddit and Bad Magic subreddit. And now this week's Time Sucker updates. Updates? Get your Time Sucker updates. This week's first update comes in from a lovely meat sack. I've met several times now, Leslie Hammonds, regarding last week's episode. Uh, Leslie writes in with the subject line of, Survivor of the Kentucky Vampire Wars, LOL. And this is what she sent. Dear Suckmaster of Knowledge and not blood to feed your 500-year-old vampire alter ego, I cannot begin to tell you how excited I was to see that you were doing an episode on the Florida vampire murders. This whole thing factors into my teen years in a few different ways. And it was a trip down memory lane, both funny and embarrassing. I grew up in a town about an hour away from Murray, Kentucky. It was just as small, but far less to do as it was not a college town. There was nowhere for teens to hang out but the local park and the arcade. Maybe the comic book store during the day. And the comic book store sold Vampire the Masquerade books. And oh boy, did my group of friends buy them in 1996. We were all 16 and our friend group was comprised of theater kids and people who just didn't fit the mainstream cliques. We'd meet up at one particular friend's house to LARP this game, think True Blood, but rated PG and cast with awkward teens. This sounds fabulous. I had a daughter of cacophony vampire character because I was heavily into choir <laughs> and dated a guy that that summer who was a werewolf character created from a white wolf spinoff. It was two weeks, just as dramatic as you would expect, and ended with him cheating on me with my best friend who played a Torador vampire. <laughs> <laughs> stupid teenage shit but still a better love story than twilight lol this is fucking great none of us though thought it was anything other than a game despite all the teenage angst and our natural flair for the dramatic being weird ass theater kids it was simply a fun way to be different in an ultra conservative kentucky town where we were already different at this time there was an unofficial christian group at the school who wore camo and combat boots and had a self-proclaimed leader super cultish who the group members treated as a messiah oh my god and who harassed many of us Playing VTM was our way of pushing back, and it definitely felt taboo and spooky and rebellious. When the vampire murders kicked off, it was a huge story in my hometown paper. It was covered as closely as the OJ trial. My parents discovered around this time that their goth-adjacent daughter who wore black nail polish was super into opera, the Crow graphic novel, Phantom of the Opera, and carried around a leather-bound book of Byron Keats and Shelley poems. I love this! I actually played this game. And thus commenced a tense kitchen table intervention. Did I understand reality and fantasy? What did my black nail polish mean? Why was I so into old music and books? Why did I like such dark, weird stuff? Did I drink blood from my friends? Holy shit. I was overwhelmed and tearfully exclaimed, I'm just a nerd, okay? <laughs> Satisfied I wasn't about to spiral. Satisfied I wasn't about to spiral into insanity and murder. They let it go, but I was embarrassed enough I didn't play anymore after that. Side note. R.I.P. mom and dad, and thanks for caring about me and my well-being enough to be concerned, as things can obviously go off the rails, as evidenced by this episode. I ended up starting college at Murray State two years later, after the vampire murders in 1998. I had many a milkshake from the vampire hotel Hardee's, but none contained blood, and I saw no dead people in the windows, kind of feel cheated. I knew people who knew the cast of characters in this story, though I can't remember what all was said about it, seeing it was so long ago. But coming from a small town, the sprawling campus with old buildings and people from all over the country and world, and a very active pagan slash Wiccan community to dabble in was unlike anything I'd ever experienced and definitely lent itself to imagination runs wild if one were so inclined. If I'd grown up there at the age when I, re when I played VTM, I can definitely see how it would have been easier to get sucked in, especially if I hadn't had my awesome parents and instead had crazy ass Sandra for a role model. Anyway, three out of five stars wouldn't change a thing. And thank you again for letting me visit this weird footnote to my upbringing in Western Kentucky. Seems like another world and another lifetime away with all these years that have passed and miles between. I turned 44 in March and now live across the country in Washington. And no, no sparkly vampires here to be found, though I'd much prefer them 
to running into someone like Rod. I'm grateful I never did, as his crazy ass brand of vampire larpers, band of vampire, vampire larpers, was just a short drive from my own. Sincerely, Leslie Hammonds. Oh man, Leslie! First off, I get great to hear from you. I, I love your face. Uh, it was great to see you, meet you at uh, both summer camps, and also how great <laughs> that you were playing the same game, just an hour away, and the same age as Rot. He also turns 44 in March. You might share a birthday. His is March 28th. Very weird to think about for me, at least, how since you were into this game at the same time and they're the same age, you two could have not only played together, you could have dated. How different would that have made your life? Or maybe you're not into, or weren't into bad boys. Uh, I'm glad you had fun, other than the uh, cheating boyfriend eh, with the game. And, you know, as did 99.9% .9 of kids who played it, I'm sure. I mean, how fun. What a great way to spend small town summer and, you know, some weekends. Hope you're well. Thanks for sending in uh, that connection. Uh, next up, Superior Space Lizard Todd. No last name, just the Todd. Sent in a message with a tantalizing subject line of the most cringe Cummins law ever. It was as good as I'd hoped. Uh, Lindsay and I both laughed so hard when she shared this message with me. And here's what Todd wrote. Greetings to the Lizard King. Hello, time sucks slash bad magic team. Let me cut right to the chase. Over the years, I've been very skeptical about many of the Cummins Law stories. Many just seem way too ridiculous to have actually happened. Don't get me wrong, the stories are funny, but I've always had my doubts. Semicolon. No fucking longer. <laughs> what I'm about to tell you is just fucking shameful. At 7.45 this morning, it was a cool overcast beginning to the day. The type of pleasant weather you don't often get in South Florida. I had to go to the grocery store and I got in my vehicle with my windows down, listening to the latest suck on the, on the Florida vampire murders. As I get to the stop sign where you exit the neighborhood, a cute little girl of about 12 is about to cross the intersection. I want to divert here for a second to clarify that when I say cute little girl, I'm saying it the way a dad would say it, not the way a creep would say it. <laughs> That's a great clarification. I feel that point is important to make based on what happens next. She was on my right and I waved her across as you are talking about Rod's conversations with Janine and the volume is not blaring, but it's loud enough for her to hear. As she is halfway across the intersection, just clear the driver's side of my car, you break into the voice of the Count. One lip touch. Ah, ah, ah. Then the girl turns towards the unmistakable laugh of the Count. And then you say, two titties I want to suck. Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> Her eyes went wide. Her steps became much quicker. As she finished crossing, never taking her eyes off the weirdo in the car. It was way too late to turn down the radio, so I just kept eye contact and shrugged, red face like, oops, what do you do? Luckily, there's no oncoming traffic, so I made a quick escape, as quick as my 2006 Ford Freestyle would muster. <laughs> That's a great vehicle. Not looking back, which would have somehow made it even creepier. So you got me after all, you son of a bitch, after I swore that most of these Cummins Law stories probably never happened. The good news is I don't live in the neighborhood, but the bad news is I'm moving there in July. So I'm gonna have to cut my hair, grow a beard just to be able to be seen without fear. I warned you that the story was cringy. I'm cringing right now writing this email, which I'm not sorry at all for the length of. I appreciate the fuck out of you and the Bad Magic team for all your hard work, bringing the best damn podcast in the game each and every week. Hail fucking Nimrod forever. Superior space lizard, Todd. Man, Todd, thank you so much for the nice words. And I love how deliciously uncomfortable this all was. And yeah, you can't fix this. I mean, if you saw that kid again and tried to talk to her, you look creepier. And it does not matter what you say. There's nothing you can say <laughs> to make this not creepy. Hopefully you can avoid returning there until you move there. I and mean, who knows? Maybe her and her family will move out. Maybe she doesn't live in the neighborhood. Maybe, maybe you can trade your car in, in addition to changing your appearance. Uh, thanks for sending in a message that just really beautifully painted such an uncomfortable scene. Uh, love it. Now, Brainy Sack, Andrew K, wrote him with the subject line of deja vu and sucking in the fourth dimension. We've gotten a lot of emails about the fourth dimension suck, which is great. I'm sure we'll have more uh, updates later. Dan Pontifex Maximus Succulum uh, and all of the olive oil and soy soaked hot hard father daddies in the Bad Magic crew. I've listened to your stand up for many years and been listening to Time Suck for about four or five years now and have finally decided to write in. Your fourth dimension suck has finally landed squarely in my academic wheelhouse and personal interest. First, I want to touch on the idea of what deja vu is and the medical slash neuroscience reasoning behind it that I was surprised you didn't find during your research or speak about it if you did. No, actually, I didn't find what you're about to share. Uh, many researchers in the fields related to brain function believe this feeling comes from a glitch in our faulty meat sack shit for brains. That's the exact medical terminology. Look it up. Uh, where the short-term memory placement becomes connected to the long-term memory area in the brain. In effect, it seems like a current event happened 
much longer ago because that new quote unquote memory gets placed into the area of our brain where we recall older memories, just some crossed wires. Now, this is not my area of expertise, but there are several medical journals and blogs that have written about this. Many anecdotal and some confirmed cases happen more frequently in people that have epilepsy or seizures. Neither clairvoyance nor displaced time that you spoke about has ever been proven scientifically, but the consistent failure of our meat sack bodies, especially within our complex monkey brains, is ever apparent. Thus, I believe that this is just another error within our meat sack, uh, meat sack minds, even if it was even if it is a very interesting one. But in my area of knowledge is the fourth dimension, since I have degrees in math and physics. I would like to give you a small idea of how one might imagine another spatial dimension on top of our three-dimensional space. First, remember that first dimension and second dimensional land. Uh, first, remember the 1D and 2D. Oh yeah, land thought experiments that I talked about in the episode. Also, to state an obvious idea, one cannot occupy the same exact space as another at the same exact time. Now, I can easily stack a second dimension on the 1D entity, though, and in effect be able to place another entity in the exact same physical spot at the same time as the 1D entity from that frame of reference just in the next dimension up. Same for 2D land. I can add another dimension and stack more triangles on top of that original triangle in the same space at the same time just on top in the third dimension. How do we do, how do, we do this for the third dimension? Well, you spoke about color at length in the episode, and I think that would be a fun thought experiment here. Let us suppose we could move in a physical space whose coordinates were based upon the color spectrum. Assume you could will yourself to move on the spectrum to a more blue shifted color or to a more red shifted color and all others in between. Now stack this movement type on top of our 3D world. Say I was standing in the center of a room but shifted to the far blue side of the color dimension. You could also stand in the exact same three-dimensional location as me at the same time, but you would need to be shifted into another more red part of the color spectrum. Just like the 1D and 2D ideas, even more people can be in the exact same 3D location at the same time, so long as they were in a distinctly separate area of the color dimension we added. Locality is a very strong tool in dimensional analysis and the mathematical field of topology that deals with multiple higher dimensions. Now, if there's a higher spatial dimension stacked on top of ours, we are unable to perceive it and how it operates, but this is basically what would be possible while still conforming to the other known physics of our universe. This is all very interesting, confusing, fun, and challenging, but I hope this illuminated some part of it. I like to call this stuff mind candy. Super sweet to think about, but not always a lot of substance. Much like conspiracy theories and other cult and religious bullshit you talk about. Thank you, Dan and the crew, for all the great mind candy information and opinions you produce, even if I don't always agree with you. You've kept me engaged and entertained at work while driving many hours as well as kept spirits a little higher while dealing with a real shitty last year. Just going to keep on sucking. Andrew K. Andrew, sorry for the tough year. Hope it's getting better. Thank you for the message. I am not even going to claim to exactly understand a lot of what you just said. I think I get the gist. Uh, that episode pushed me uh, to finally watch the movie Interstellar, by the way. And I think I got a lot more out of that fantastic movie than I would have if I wouldn't have learned what I did regarding speculation about the fourth dimension. Uh, your thoughts about displaced memories do make sense. Kind of bummed me out. Based on the link you included to that Texas A&M medical journal, I, I don't doubt the memories that memories do get stored in the wrong place. But what if sometimes we do wander into the fourth dimension in our dreams? Come on. I know that the science isn't there, but just let me think it's possible, Andrew. Love the expertise and appreciate the time you took to send it in. Also, if anyone liked the episode on the fourth dimension and has not seen Interstellar, highly recommend. One more from super smartest sack, Brian Williams. Subject line of, I fucking figured it out. Brian has nailed what the fourth dimension is all about. Lindsay also thought this one was hilarious. Uh, Brian writes, Dear Sir, Dr. Reverend Dan Jebediah, Lord Suckington II, Esquire Jr. <laughs> the fourth dimension isn't that hard to understand. It may seem super complex, but broken down, the fourth missing dimension is merely in and out. Now hear me out. Just think for a second. We are all three-dimensional beings on a fourth dimensional plane, but can't access it much like the triangle to the cube. But we can move up, down, side to side in our three-dimensional existence. But add in and out, and you can access the fourth dimension. And that is where babies come from. See, adding in and out is how we all got here. At one time, I was not here. My parents added some of that fourth dimensional in and out. Now I'm here. I believe doctors are the cubes to our triangles. They are the ones who bring the babies from out of sight and, quote, deliver them onto this plane. And, ah, shit, I'm losing it. These fourth dimensional weed gummies are wearing off and I've lost my train of thought. I become cubed again. Anyways, love everything that is bad magic and if you could please 
not shout out Noah Curry because fuck that dude. He'll get it. Your creepy sucker, Brian Williams. P.S. Your dad in and outed your mother a lot. And that's where he came from. Thank you, Brian. Uh, appreciate the parental visual. At the end, that's good stuff. Uh, what if I really did like it? That'd be a little weird. Uh, I think that you really cracked the code here. It all seems so complicated, but you really broke it down and you made it accessible to a simple mind like myself. Uh, yeah, I understand now. I just need to get high, have sex with Lindsay, and I can in and out both of us into the fourth dimension. Maybe if we fuck enough or fast enough, we can time travel. I hope. I think it's worth a shot. Hail Lucifina. Thank you, Brian. And one last thing, fuck Noah Curry. Next time, suckers. I needed that. We all did. Thanks for listening to another Bad Magic Productions podcast. Scared to death and time suck each week. Short sucks. Nightmare fuel on the time suck and scared to death podcast feeds some weeks. On Fridays currently. Uh, Please don't lose any weight for the Lord this week. Lose it for your health. If you need to. Lose it for yourself if you want to. Or, I don't know, enjoy a couple slices of Meat Lover's Pizza, big cup of Fountain Dr. Pepper, Brownie Sunday, and crash out on the fucking couch where, skinny or not, you can always enjoy uh, keeping on sucking. Add Magic Productions. I know, I know I've already probably kicked this dead horse too many times. But I, I do still want an excuse to hit that Tarzan button some more. Like, what if you heard that coming from a dark alley? <laughs> Will you rush in to see if they need help? Or what if you heard that coming from the hotel room next door? Ugh. Did you do anything other than just laugh? Worst case, what if your house is haunted? And that's the sound the ghost makes up in the attic in the middle of the night. Okay, I think I I feel satisfied now. Almost.